And then recording has started. I'll admit everyone in the waiting room. Thanks, Veronica. Once everyone's admitted, I'll turn it over to you to go through the online meeting ground rules. All right. Um, let me know if you can see my screen. Yep. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Veronica Sun, and I'll be your technical host for tonight. Uh, thank you all for joining. To start off with a few housekeeping rules. This meeting has been called up to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meetings are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions will be limited to three minutes. No person shall speak except when recognized by myself and no person shall speak for longer than the given three minutes. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using their real name. Any person believed to be using a name other than the one they are commonly known by will not be permitted to speak. Uh, a reminder, if you're on the phone, you need to press star six to unmute and star nine to raise your hand. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers. All others will participate by voice only. I will enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates them. The chat function is enabled for tonight's meeting and will be used for individuals to communicate with the host, myself. It should be used for technical and online platform related questions only. If an attendee attempts to use the chat for any other reason, the city reserves the right to disable the individual's access to the chat. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screens during the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Veronica. Our next item of business is the approval of the minutes from our July 11th meeting. Does anyone have any edits that they would like to see made? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes as they are. I move to approve the minutes from July. Thanks, Ryan. I'll second that. There's no deliberation. Oh, Tila? No, I'm, I just have to abstain. I wasn't here. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, the four that were, all those in favor? That's four to approve and Tila abstaining. Thank you. Our next. Uh, Item is public comment and any members of the public wishing to speak to the board about a matter of transportation will have three minutes to do so. If you're interested in speaking, please use the reaction tool in Zoom to raise your digital hand. And if there aren't any members of the public here for public comment, we can move on to agenda item four. I think we're joined by Sergeant Robert, Robin Vanderlees from the Boulder Police Department and Devin Jocelyn from Transportation Mobility to talk about recent traffic crashes. Thank you very much, Alex. Let me share my screen. All right, well, good evening, Tab. Uh, my name is Devin Joslin. I'm the principal traffic engineer for the city in the Transportation and Mobility Department. And I'm joined tonight by Sergeant Robin Vanderleest, who is in the traffic division of the Boulder Police Department. And we're here tonight to provide a 2022 mid-year severe crash update. 
There are four main things uh, we'd like to cover tonight. Uh, the first is to go over some definitions, uh, provide a high level severe crash summary, compare how crashes are trending this year uh, to trends that we've seen in the Safe Streets report, uh, specifically related to the areas of concern that were highlighted in that report. And then Robin will provide an update on uh, a serious bodily injury crash that occurred back in January at Broadway and Ash. And we'll leave some time following this presentation for discussion. And with respect to uh, definitions, wanted to just get everyone on the same page in terms of what we consider to be a severe crash within the city of Boulder. Severe crash is a term that transportation and mobility created back in 2019 when we were working on the Safe Streets report. And it refers to any crash that results in a fatality or evident incapacitating injury, which are referred to as level four or level three injuries on the state of Colorado traffic crash report form. Uh, severe crashes are commonly referred to in the industry as KSI crashes or killed or seriously injured uh, crashes. For the purposes of a crash report, a fatal injury is any injury that results in death within 30 days of the crash. Examples of incapacitating, evident incapacitating injuries include such things as severe lacerations, broken or destroyed limbs, and internal injuries. This also includes an injured party transported to a hospital because of the severity of the injuries. Examples of evident non-incapacitating injuries include such things as momentary unconsciousness, bruises, lumps, and minor lacerations. This also includes injuries that are treated at the scene and do not require further medical attention away from the scene. Robin will begin her presentation later with further clarification on what is considered a serious bodily injury crash. Uh, but the definition of serious bodily injuries is included here on this slide um, as stated in the Colorado revised statutes. And I'll highlight here that this year in Boulder, there have been three crashes uh, that have involved serious bodily injuries. And Sergeant Vanderlees is going to speak to one of those later in the presentation. This slide highlights the key findings and trends from the analyses conducted for the most recent Safe Streets Boulder report based on the 2018 through 2020 crash data. The key findings remain the same as presented to you in prior briefings, so I won't spend too much time uh, pointing these out again. What I do want to point out here is that severe crashes have remained fairly steady at an average of between 55 to 60 per year. The city did experience a slight decrease to 50 severe crashes in 2021. And going back to 2009, the highest severe crash year was 2014 with 71, and the lowest severe crash years were 2015 and 2020, both with 38 severe crashes. The total number of crashes helps provide broader context to the number of severe crashes. The city so far in 2020 uh, through June 2030, or um, excuse me, June 30th, 2020, so half the year, um, has experienced 865 total crashes and is on an almost identical pace to 2021 in terms of the projected total number of crashes. The 865 that have occurred so far this year are shown with the blue bar and the projected total basically doubling the 865 is shown with the orange bar. Oh yeah. Looking at severe crashes to date uh, or through June 30th, 2020, there have been a total of 25 severe crashes. And I'll point uh, out that so far there have been no fatal crashes within the city limits through June 30th. Uh, historically, from the severe or the Safe Streets Boulder report, we know that severe crashes have represented between about two and a half to three percent of total crashes, and severe crashes through June 30th, 2022, have equated to about 2.9 percent of total crashes. So it indicates that severe crashes are on a fairly steady pace uh, with prior years. <clears throat> Looking at the location of 2022 severe crashes. The top corridors where they're occurring so far correspond closely with the core arterial network, uh, the segments along Broadway, 30th Street, 
Arapahoe Avenue and Baseline Road. I do wanna point out that uh, there was a fatal crash, a double fatal crash that occurred on Foothills Parkway, north of Diagonal Highway on April 9th. Um, this crash is not included in the data presented tonight since the investigation was handled by Colorado State Patrol and occurred outside of the city limits. Uh, but I do wanna take just a moment and recognize the victims who lost their lives in that crash. 33-year-old Ori Sioni and 49-year-old Gregoria Morales Ramirez. These next slides will detail the who, what, where, when, and why related to the severe crashes that have occurred uh, through the first half of 2022. And it'll compare the trends so far this year to the trends noted in the most recent Safe Streets report. With respect to who has been involved in the crashes, uh, what we've seen so far is that in 2022, eight of the 28 severe crashes, nearly a third of them, have been crashes involving a single vehicle, motorcycle, or scooter. Um, so in other words, it's just a single uh, rider or driver uh, who has crashed and had uh, severe injuries. Um, the six severe crashes that we've had so far in involving motorcycles exceeds our annual motor motorcycle severe crash totals from 2018 through 2020. In those years, we averaged a total of four to five motorcycle crashes uh, throughout the entire year. And again, we've seen six motorcycle crashes so far in the first half of 2022. Uh, as well, so far in 2022, severe crashes involving bicycles and pedestrians uh, appear to be down compared to historical trends. This slide details the severe crashes by crash type and relative to trends within the most recent Safe Streets report, again, uh, the data indicates that severe crashes involving bicycles and pedestrians are down so far this year, while other crash types are generally trending closely to prior trends. <clears throat> uh, this slide shows where the severe crashes are occurring by street classification. Arterials continue to again be where most severe crashes are occurring. 72% of severe crashes that have occurred through the first half of 2022 uh, occurred on arterials. And that's tracking slightly higher than the three-year trend of 67% noted in the most recent Safe Streets report. This slide provides additional details about where severe crashes are occurring in the city uh, with respect to the intersection type. The data so far in 2022 indicates that signalized intersections continue to be a location where severe crashes frequently occur. 40% of severe crashes through the first half of 2022 have occurred at signalized intersections, which is in line with most recent historical trends. This slide details the severe crashes by lighting condition. Uh, we looked at this, although the Safe Streets report didn't explicitly track the trends related to the time of day, when severe crashes were occurring. Um, but it is interesting to note here that nearly two thirds of the severe crashes that have occurred uh, in the first half of 2022 occurred during the, the daylight hours. This slide details the factors contributing to severe crashes such as distraction, red light running, speeding, impairment, and making a left turn. The 2020 data through June 30th indicates that crashes resulting from distraction are trending up, while those involving making, making a left turn, speeding, and impairment appear to be trending down. The city has experienced six severe crashes attributed to distraction so far in 2022. This exceeds the 2018 through 2020 totals in which the city averaged about three distracted driving severe crashes per year. I'd like to transition now to speak about one way in which the Vision Zero Action Plan update is taking a proactive approach to reducing severe crashes. A key component to the updated Vision Zero Action Plan is to analyze crash data in a few different ways. 
one of which is referred to as systemic safety analysis. This method seeks to evaluate risks across the entire transportation system rather than only managing risk at specific locations. The method compares historical crash data against transportation system risk factors such as vehicle speeds, traffic volumes, land uses, demographics, and other factors. The main goal of systemic safety analysis is to proactively identify areas that may have a higher potential for crashes to occur in the future because they are locations where many factors overlap. Strategies to address the risk factors will then be recommended in these areas based on a system-wide basis to hopefully prevent crashes from occurring in those areas prior to there being a number of people seriously killed or injured at those locations. And I want to highlight here as well uh, to give TAB just a brief update that for the systemic analysis, the project team will be reviewing and incorporating the results of our community engagement efforts, which were ongoing for the past two months. Uh, this includes close to 700 pins that were dropped on our interactive web map to identify locations where people did not feel safe when driving, walking, or biking, as well as locations where they may have experienced a close call or just in general felt uh, safety improvements were necessary. We also received 700 completed questionnaires that will help the project team further understand travel trends and top traffic safety concerns within the community. And the preliminary results from the questionnaire indicate that distracted driving, drivers not yielding to pedestrians or bicyclists, and speeding are the top traffic safety concerns of the Boulder community. Uh, so I'll wrap up my portion of the presentation with some key takeaways. Uh, again, they're, they're listed here, but I wanna highlight again that approximately half of the single vehicle user crashes uh, were flagged as in being uh, caused by distracted driving or riding. Uh, others were a result of falling asleep at the wheel, uh, a flat tire, or another cause not specifically listed on the crash report. Uh, again, with respect to those single vehicle crashes, uh, motorcycles were involved in four of the eight single vehicle crashes. Uh, one of them involved an e-bike user on a multi-use path. And the 33% uh, single vehicle crashes is fairly close to what we saw in 2021, uh, where we had 27% of severe crashes involved a single uh, vehicle user. I'll now hand it over to Sergeant Vanderleest uh, to discuss the serious bodily injury crash that occurred on January 3rd near Broadway and Ash. Devin, thank you for that. Uh, board members, thank you for inviting me back to give a presentation. I truly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Devin, if you wouldn't mind going back to the definitions page, just so I can kind of touch on that. Sure. Apologies for the fast movement there. So when we talk about uh, inj injury severity in the police department, we follow the state standards. Um, the word severe crash really doesn't play into our reporting. Um, I just want to be sure that, that you understand the difference between um, the serious crashes that Devin is talking about and the severe crashes that all present upon most serious crashes, um, and you'll notice the definition for SBI or serious bodily injury, is a quite a large range. The majority of those crashes are at the low end of the range um, where there's um, a, a broken bone or a laceration. Um, when they become severe, when somebody is seriously uh, injured to the point where they could lose their life, that's when we call it a, a severe crash. Um, and that's when our investigative team comes out and reconstructs the crash for um, DA consideration and charging. As Devin mentioned, thank you, Devin, if you wouldn't mind, you can go back to my first slide. As Devin mentioned, this year we've only had three what we would consider severe crashes, and we've had no fatal crashes uh, so far this year. So we're having a, a very good year. The, the crash that I want to talk about is the uh, crash that occurred on January 3rd in the afternoon, about 13.22 or 1.22 in the afternoon. Um, officers Alex Casera and Officer DJ Smith were the primary officers on that crash. Next slide, please. 
It occurred at Broadway and Ash in the southbound lanes. Pull up my notes real quick. And you can show the next slide, please. So at approximately uh, 1.22 in the afternoon, we began receiving um, multiple 911 calls reference this injury accident. Um, and um, uh, witnesses first reported to us that it was a vehicle and a pedestrian that had been involved. Uh, when we got on scene, we learned that uh, 2004 Acura had suffered a flat tire and the driver had pulled to the far right lane and the southbound lanes to change it. He had uh, turned on his hazard lights. He had uh, opened the hood, hoping that would be a, another indicator. And then his trunk was open and he was at the back of the car uh, obtaining tools um, for his, uh, his task at hand. Um, that was uh, unfortunately the time of the collision. Um, a vehicle traveling in that same lane struck the back of that vehicle and he suffered a double leg amputation and a broken left arm on scene. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a basically a Google picture of those three lanes. You'll see that there was no available shoulder uh, for him to pull off on. And the next uh, side street, which was Dartmouth, was approximately 1,500 feet further south. He didn't feel like he could drive that far um, on, his broke, on his flat tire. Next slide, please. So the driver of the 2021 Tesla, the, the at-fault driver was a 25-year-old male. He was driving home from Shake Shack there at the 29th Street Mall. He felt like he was traveling about 40 to 45 miles an hour. Uh, he had not turned on the internal cameras, uh, so they were not working. Um, neither had they activated any of the automated driving features that Tesla is known for. So the vehicle did not assist him in any way. Our investigation revealed that the vehicle was traveling about 37 miles an hour, about five seconds prior to that collision and was steady. So there was no braking prior to impact. Uh, further investigation also revealed that marijuana was a factor in this crash and we charged the driver with vehicular assault. Next slide, please. So pretty much that concludes my presentation on that crash, but I'm definitely available for any uh, questions that you might have regarding it. Thank you, Robin. I'm, and the questions I had for TAB to help facilitate the discussion are listed there, but certainly welcome to any others that you may have relative to this presentation. Thank you, Devin and Sergeant Vanderlees. It's always interesting to hear a little more details about some of these things that, that come across the, the news throughout the year. Uh, do any members of TAB have any questions for our speakers, Tila? Thank you. I, I want to just first express my appreciation that you are here. It's something I've been asking for for several months uh, to have sort of more regular touch points. Um, Sergeant Vanderlees, it's always nice to see you, even though it's always a terrible circumstance when we do see you. Um, I was just struck at the at the end, and I recognize this is probably not uh, a decision by the police department, but the decision to charge the driver with vehicular assault as opposed to something like reckless driving, which has I, I I'm not sure which has more um, of a um, of a penalty attached or you know potential penalty. Also. Uh, I think it does matter that the person who was struck was outside the vehicle um, because I think then, then it does um, trigger our statewide vulnerable road user law. So could you give us any insight that you might have on why it was vehicular assault versus reckless driving or reckless endangerment or some other charge and then whether um, we should be expecting um, the vulnerable road user law to be also enhancing these um, penalties. Yep. I'll speak to the first question first. So the driver was not considered a vulnerable road user because he was not acting as a pedestrian. He was not in the marked pedestrian crosswalk. He was not utilizing facilities um, as such. And so unfortunately it, it does not pertain to him. Um, and the second part of the question is the vehicular assault actually is the higher charge to reckless driving. It, it has um, a piece, uh, a culpability piece uh, that he should have um, 
been more under control as opposed to the reckless driving, which is a little bit more uh, without uh, wanton and willfulness um, or with want, yeah, without wanton. Right. Willfulness. Yeah. So, right. uh, so it actually is the higher charge and the marijuana is what um, bumped that up to the higher criminal charge. Understood. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate the insight because I was wondering, you know, when I heard about this crash and thought, oh, it's a Tesla and there goes, you know, our faith in all these automated, you know, collision avoidance technologies and things. Um, I wasn't aware you could even turn all of that stuff off in a Tesla. Um, I think, yeah, I think more importantly, you need to turn them on. So I, I think what we're finding with most people that are involved in crashes with their with their fancy new technology, they're right. not familiar with how to utilize it. And so it's not activated. Um, and so we are finding a lot of people with the, the new um, automated uh, vehicles just haven't activated it. Gotcha. Interesting. Um, Devin, I had a question for you um, because we talked about this um, when we were finalizing the Safe Streets report at the end of last year. And I had noted that in previous Safe Streets reports, we had also been tracking age of driver. Um, and I know that that is, you know, that's clearly noted in every crash report that we get. Um, or is this something we're no longer tracking? Um, because, you know, anecdotally and just sort of like my gut memory of, of our most several last years of um, of serious injury crashes and fatal crashes have involved us, what feels like an outsized number of, um, of young or inexperienced drivers. And so I'm wondering, are we continuing to track that? Have we made a decision as a city to no longer pay attention to that? Uh, what can you tell me about that? Yeah, thanks for that question, Tila. That is something that we are still tracking, and I apologize for not including that in the presentation. I, I left it out in the interest of time, but uh, happy to answer that question here. I do have some details ready. Um, with respect to what we've seen so far uh, on the ages that have been reported on the crash forms, we have seen three of the severe crashes uh, that have involved drivers that have been uh, 65 or older. And then relative to our younger driver population, um, none, of the, none of the severe crashes appear to have impacted or involved children under 15. Um, in two of the crashes, um, it does appear as though uh, one 16-year-old driver was, was at fault, and then one 17-year-old was a victim. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so it is something we're gonna continue to kind of keep uh, an eye on. And if, we, if we're if noticing trends, we will have, or if we are, we're curious if there are trends, we will continue to have data on that. Yes. Terrific, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Um, what's the speed limit in that particular intersection? Is it around 55? I think you're muted. Sorry about that. It is, it's 40 miles an hour there. And are there any plans to reduce speed in intersections when something horrible like this happens? I mean. I think it's a great question for Devin. The police department doesn't set speed limits. Yeah, yeah Trini, I think that is something that um, can be considered um, as, as something relative to the context of the road. Um, but I would say historically that a severe crash occurring on a segment of roadway in and of itself doesn't necessarily merit uh, a change to the speed limit and that it's more so often a, a comprehensive review of the traffic volumes and prevailing speeds. Um, but we are seeing with uh, some new research out there that the city is planning to look at more closely in an upcoming project, um, ways to better incorporate context uh, sensitive aspects of the roadway, uh, one of which may be the crash history along the roadway segment. Thank you. I have um, a follow up, and I'm sorry, I'm in a lousy, uh, sorry, a loud, a noisy place. <laughs> loud and noisy. <laughs> the airport, so kind of. Um, but uh, if you can't hear me, please let me know. Um, uh, 
Yeah, my I, one question I have is when there's that kind of reconstruction of the, what happened, um, does, um, I realize that's mostly, it sounds like largely for legal purposes moving forward and understanding what happened, but does it also include in, like, looking at, would all the, would, would um, design, street design expertise be included there, whether it's from the transportation department or the police department, is somebody there looking at the sort of design factors that help contribute, or is it largely looking at the factors having to do with the, the, the people as they were or, or what they were doing? Yeah, so our uh, reconstruction is for the first part for prosecution purposes. But the, the great thing about our relationship with the transportation department is that we uh, share all, all of our data with them. So then they can take a look on the back end and see if any, um, any sort of design flaw or any design um, improvements can be made in an area. So I would say it's twofold, but for our purposes, it truly is for prosecution. Thanks. And um, I guess that uh, leads you to another question, which is probably for Devin then. Um, as part of the systemic safety analysis, it includes speed and volume. Is road design an explicit criteria? Um, or like, I guess I'm wondering how that, I mean, I understand land use and, and these things aren't all distinct, but um, is it sort of explicitly factored in like this is road with this many lanes and the lanes are this wide and, and things like that? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Becky. And I, I think the answer to that is um, it certainly does include a lot of the factors I mentioned. I think more specifically to your question, um, it does look at speed limit as, as a risk factor in and of itself. And I, I don't recall off the top of my head what the threshold is that we're using in our analysis, but what I've seen historically is like 35 or 40 are the roadway segments that you would, might flag as that as as speed being a risk factor along that roadway? Um, but then it's it probably is dependent upon the crash type that you're most interested in analyzing, as far as how those different risk factors get overlaid and paired um, to make a determination about the crashes that would most likely be occurring at a location and then what could be done proactively to address them. I have a question. So I live very close to where this crash happened or relatively close. And um, I travel on Broadway quite often. Is there a, like a, a record of how many people are being um, cited for speeding? Because it seems to me that people on Broadway are driving a lot faster than 40 miles an hour on a regular basis. And I just would like to know if there have been like a, I don't know, like a representative number of infractions that have occurred in that particular segment, especially like from Table Mesa to Baseline, that stretch seems to be like a free for all. Yep. Yeah, Tony, I, I agree with you. Um, yeah. First of all, it's downhill. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's a wide road. So it's, it's actually one of the favorite, my favorite places to sit when I have some uh, free time uh, hey. to do enforcement. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know what the numbers are uh, as far as of how many tickets have been issued in that area and, and what I can, I can look that up for you if you're more interested. Um, I can tell you that our, our ability to do enforcement is, um, has been uh, hard this year, just for staffing purposes. Our, our traffic unit is at 50% right now, um, which makes it very difficult for us to have free time to go out and write tickets. And we try and do uh, enforcement. We try and balance between complaint areas and, and areas that are higher in crashes. And so um, I would tell you that those numbers are gonna be lower than I would like for them to be. And they're, they're lower than they have been in the past. And would we benefit perhaps in researching like a speed camera and maybe Dartmouth or maybe um, on actually on baseline somewhere or flashing lights, something to kind of deter 
driver behavior? Um, so the camera uh, program is very specific. The law is written specifically so that it can be placed in areas that are 30 miles an hour or less. And it has to be a specific um, dynamic of, of land use. And unfortunately, I don't have that memorized either. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as design goes, I think maybe Devin can talk a little bit more about um, some possibilities. And you know, obviously, the 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 tab will have to decide about finances and recommendations about where that money goes. Thank you. Yeah, Trini, I think that's one of the things that we'll be looking at more closely with the action plan is where we where we would get the most return on our investment for those types of dynamic speed feedback signs and where they would have the most impact on drivers mm -hmm. um, is one thing we'll be looking at as a countermeasure um, to hopefully reduce arterial speeding since as Rob, robin said we are limited by the state legislature on where photo enforcement can be performed um, that being said we are continuing to work behind the scenes with Carl Castillo and our um, you know, legislature folks within the city um, to craft a vision for those policies that we wanna fight hardest for at the state legislature. And that photo enforcement does seem to be one that is rising to the top on our priorities. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Lorraine? Sergeant Vanderlees, thank you also uh, for making the time for this. Um, I just I had a couple of comments in reaction to things I heard, and also a question um, similar, uh, following up on something I heard. Um, first, the thank you, uh, Sergeant, for for clarifying um, on on Becky's question about is there a fault finding for for design or consideration of design, and, and I heard you say that that that's that's transportation department's um, consideration. And um, I, I guess just just comment would be that um, in in future, just in general, in, in future kind of assessments in which we we consider um, uh, f future crashes, uh, would love to yeah just see a little more as sort of like as part of the presentation from transportation side, um, some kind of a, a maybe more systematic like um, just just uh, analysis of here, here are the design factors at play and here's what we think supported this being more of a driver, you know, kind of error sort of thing versus here are some, you know, design features that may have contributed to it or th things we've learned from a design perspective. Um, I don't mean to pick at anything specifically here, but just that I think that's um, one of the things we're gonna, it's gonna really help us to reduce crashes in the future. Um, so anyway, just to comment on that. And then um, also, uh, Sergeant Vanderlees, I don't want to read too much into your your comment that um, that there's you know there are certain locations you know where to sit uh, with a radar gun. But goodness gracious, that sounds interesting to me. That is there a map of these places? Um, it sounds to me like in a like a like a market. I don't know if you call the market uh, inefficiency, but if we know that there are places where people speed, goodness, that sounds like a design matter to me. Anyway, I, I don't want to. I don't mean to be like you know. Um, make anything too big out of that that statement but that sounds like an interesting thing to um maybe just for us collectively to think about going ahead are there sort of like known hotspot areas that are not not for crashes per se but for for risk um be, because of speeding um so anyway no need to respond unless you want to but i, I thought i'd offer those um and i i didn't I'll just ask my question and on um something tila had said about the i, I had similar questions on ooh, what was going on with the tesla computer and um I would be curious just to hear, Sergeant, um, how does it how does it work um, that you like just sort of what's the process you get you you arrive at the crash you want to check out and see was the autopilot activated how can you just do that and then you feel like that's you, you have a confident answer on the spot or how how, do, how does that work like what do you just sort of like what buttons do you push or what do you how do you how, what do you do to know that that's that sort of okay well we we can check that box. Yep, that's a that's a great question. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the speed enforcement. So there are areas that we know that uh, speed contributes to crashes. Um, and as uh, Devin had mentioned, they are on our arterial roadways. Uh, so foothills, baseline, um, Broadway, 
uh, 28th, once it gets inside the city, um, those are definitely places that, that we focus on. And I, you know, my personal opinion is the people that are speeding on the arterial roadways are the same people that are speeding in the residential areas. And while sitting in a residential area is not necessarily time productive for us, we know that we're making a difference if we're sitting on the arterial roadways. So, and then each officer has its own, you know, uh, personal investment and, and Broadway for some reason just strikes a nerve with me. It is 40 miles an hour and I think people have high speeds there. Um, and it's, it's just a place that I feel invested. So that's kind of how that works. Um, okay, so the question about, uh, well, we'll talk, we'll talk about vehicles in general. Um, when we arrive on scene, we assess pretty quickly, is it a vehicle that's going to have a system that we can tap into? And if it does have a system, uh, then we start a couple of different processes. Uh, Tesla is great about sharing data, and there's a lot of data that they can share with us without any sort of um, warrants that are needed. Um, otherwise, if it's not a Tesla vehicle, our, our general avenue is either to ask the driver for consent to access those data points or to apply for a search warrant. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I have a um, question about accessing the data. Um, I my understanding is, or at least I've, I've I've looked for where crash data, like the most recent crash data, can be found, and I think the most recent I could find was from twenty nineteen with the Vision Zero dashboard. And I'm wondering if there would it be possible to have crash data available um, a lot more like recent than that, for instance. I know in some cities are able to have like a database of updated so that you can see crashes that happened within the last, up to the last three weeks um, that are published in like, an open data platform. And I just think that'd be really valuable um, to have that be public. Um, so I'm wondering if, if that's possible and if not, what are the barriers um, to that happening? Yeah, I, I was going to say, that's more of a Devin. I, I can start out there, Becky, and then um, Veronica, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if, if you have anything to add, Veronica is also intimately involved with our crash data and the crash data records management. Um, what I will say as a positive, Becky, is that we have a direct link, uh, staff does, to the PD crash database. So we do get on the spot information um, that is up to date, and that's part of the reason we could provide the update that we did tonight with the information that we had uh, through the end of June. It's only lagging about a month behind. Um, but with respect to your broader question, um, I don't know, Veronica, if, if you are able to add anything to that. Yeah, I can add to it. Um, we're currently working with uh, the IT department PD to create a dashboard to have more of an open data source for these crashes. Um, I can't say when that will come active, but we're working on a public facing dashboard as well as an internal dashboard so that everyone within the city and then outside the city could have access to more recent data rather than waiting for the transportation department to manually update it every few years. But that is to come. Great, thank you. I'm yeah. I'm really I'm really happy to hear that. Um, and I think just add that even if it, you know, even if it's just the table, um, you know, so that people could just download the table um, that's more recent. Like that alone would be a, just a huge. Um, I think a big a, yeah, just big indication of you know, just further indication of our commitment. Um, to addressing these crashes by making them public and also help answer people's questions um, so they can you know download the data and look at the cross tabs and do kind of that kind of analysis i think it's just a great way to enable the community to engage that more deeply with with you know helping address crashes and reducing them in the future so um thanks veronica i'm, I'm glad to hear that and becky i'd like to add and it would also serve as an assertion of positive things that the city's doing Correct. I mean, it's it's a reflection of good things, you know, because we could um, demonstrate how things are um, co in comparison to 
a couple of years back, where at a national level, I believe it is the three-year cycle that you're speaking about, Becky. Um, so it's kind of frustrating, but yeah. So Devin and Veronica, when Becky said, you know, she went and looked for this and the most recent stuff that she could find was 2019, was she looking in the right place? You know, because your response started out, Devin, as like, well, we get updated right away. But um, she was sort of asking, like, as a member of the public or, you know, someone who's interested, is there a way to find more recent information or does it have to wait for that manual update that Veronica talked about? Yeah, my understanding is that it does require a manual update on steps and at this time, and that's what we're working to solve. Okay, and then just before we go, in case we're wrapping up on this, um, I did also want to acknowledge, Devin, thank you for um, for naming the people who have died, even though they were not within our city limits. Uh, it was, you know, inches away, <laughs> it feels. Uh, and it's something that I have been um, really focused on for a couple of years is to acknowledge that there are people dying on our roadways and not mere numbers. So I just wanted to, you know, give you a, a hat tip for, for hearing that and responding to it and acknowledging these people's lives that were lost on our roadways. And it's, it's all part and parcel of, of valuing human life and avoiding more loss in the future. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. I think it's we still have our work set up for us and our arterials and perhaps with the South Broadway bus lanes, if we were to in, install the bus only lanes in our outer lanes, that would limit the opportunities for speeding, especially when the in the busier hours. So thanks. Next up, agenda item five. We'll welcome Chris and Samantha for AMPS Ramp access management and parking strategies, residential access management program, performance-based pricing. Alphabet soup. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, Tab. I'm Chris Jones, the Interim Director of Community Vitality, and I am joined this evening by Sam Bromberg. She is our Senior Project Manager leading our AMPS strategies. Our veteran TAB members will recall that um, I and Chris Haglin uh, joined you all last fall to present a number of changes that we had proposed for January of this year, as well as a 2022 work plan um, related to performance-based pricing in our on-street managed systems in our commercial areas, as well as um, pr uh, priority-based neighborhood access management, now known as our residential access management program. Um, and Sam has been working very hard on um, implementing these strategies. She's prepared an information item that we've been sharing with a number of boards and commissions. And it's going to council, I believe, in this week or next week's packet. She can correct me. Um, but I uh, wanted to, to take this opportunity to just give you all an update on where we're at in the 2022 work plan in advance of uh, developing recommendations for implementation in 2023. So with that, I'm glad to hand it over to Sam. Thanks, Chris. And thanks to Tab for having me here tonight. Let me just share my screen. Oh. And let me know if you can see that all right. I think I see a nod. <clears throat> So as Chris said, my name's Samantha Bromberg. I'm a project manager with Community Vitality. I'm here to <clears throat> update TAB on several of the AMPS initiatives, provide some background and otherwise prepare the board for the fall when we'll plan to return with specific implementation recommendations for which we'll be soliciting feedback at that time. <clears throat> So just a high level overview of access management and parking strategy initiatives. As you can see um, on the right, all of the current and ongoing AMPS initiatives, I'll be talking about uh, two and three, parking pricing strategy and residential access management. Um, <clears throat> but just to give you an idea of what's going on and what uh, we have coming in the future as well. couple of recent changes that have happened in 2022 um, to support uh, the start of these program implementations. Um, we To set the stage for performance-based pricing, uh, which is variable on-street pricing based on demand, all on-street parking rates were increased by 25 cents per hour. 
off street parking was maintained at $1.25 per hour with the tiered pricing eliminated and a maximum daily rate of $15 implemented for stays longer than six hours. <clears throat> To increase safety and compliance for users of the right-of-way, we implemented graduated and safety mobility fines, increasing base fines for mini parking violations and introduced graduated fines for repeat violations and mobility safety fines, which are higher fines for violations that create unsafe conditions for other travelers. <clears throat> the last change was that neighborhood parking permits were increased by $10 for residents and $20 for commuters with the goal of achieving cost recovery for the program in a few years. Lastly, to implement the Residential Access Management Program or RAMP, we mounted a robust data collection program to study parking occupancy in Boulder's residential neighborhoods. So here's our proposed roadmap for 2023. <clears throat> We will be increasing the permit pricing for uh, neighborhood parking permits once again. Along that, we'll be implementing uh, a new discount program for income qualified individuals, which is detailed in the revised city manager rule. That was attachment B in the memo that was provided to you. For performance-based pricing, we'll be fully implementing the program. So that introduces variable pricing, pricing by block face based on demand. <clears throat> We are recommending the implementation of a trailhead access management work group under which OSMP, which is open space and mountain parks, transportation and mobility and community vitality staff will study residential areas near OSMP trailheads and access points with observed parking spillover to determine an approach to mitigate that spillover and utilize uh, TDM strategies to encourage travel beyond the pers personal vehicle <clears throat> to those destinations. And lastly, we'll continue to study residential parking patterns to, de to determine where parking mitigation might be useful. And then uh, our next steps here, uh, we're continuing our data collection. We're nearly at the end of our effort for this year um, to be able to analyze um, the results of that data and present it in the fourth quarter in the fall to um, all boards, commissions, and council with our final recommendations based on that analysis. And then we'll also be putting together a new communications plan to communicate those, those changes for performance-based pricing and ramp to the public. So um, that's the end of my very high level presentation. And I'd like to open it up for questions if there are any. Happy to revisit any of the slides as well. Thanks, Samantha. Any tab members have questions? Tila? Thanks very much, Sam and Chris. Uh, I think my my biggest question, Sam, I, I wasn't um, I didn't have my like record on mentally yet when you first started speaking, but um you said you would be soliciting feedback in the fall yes uh tell me more about that because my my ba my first question before talking to you this evening was why is this merely an information item what are you asking of tab and when do we give substantive feedback yeah that's a great question um really our aim for tonight was to update all boards and commissions and council to remind them of what we've been doing so far we do have a city man a, a revised city manager rule and a new city manager rule that we're hoping to uh, <clears throat> put forward to open for public comment. So there are changes happening, um, but our final recommendations are based on like a whole year of data collection that we're still very much in the midst of, and that we'll be presenting to you with recommend with specific implementation re recommendations. So which blocks will be uh, increasing in pricing for performance-based pricing, which ones might be decreasing um, under the, the new <clears throat> performance-based pricing program. And then for RAMP, what were the results of the occupancy analysis that we've been doing? So what does parking occupancy mm -hmm. look like in uh, all across the city, both in existing NPP zones and in newly identified areas? And uh, what changes we're recommending that we make in 2023? Um, so it's been a, a pretty serious effort, a whole lot of data collection. Um, and we just wanted to make sure that boards and uh, commissions and councils were, were ready to um, provide the input once we come back to them in the fall. 
Okay, ready to provide input about how you are doing on what you've decided you're pursuing. Um, <laughs> um, because I guess I'm I'm wondering, Chris, you're um, yeah, you're gonna take this one. This is great. Um, because there's definitely some like a bigger picture items that Tab has been asking for sort of quicker action on or more um, um, more fine grained, I suppose, um, changes to the program that I'm that are still not showing up and. I have asked repeatedly for TAB to be consulted earlier and more um, frequently on this kind of thing, um, perhaps to the detriment <laughs> yeah. of- Yeah, happy to chime You don't want to talk to me. <laughs> no, well, we certainly want to come to TAB for advice um, in this work, and that's what- Sure, but you're just you're, you're here tonight just to tell us what's going on. And I'm, I'm like, when are you going to so, ask yeah. us for advice? Because it feels like we're, we're missing an opportunity to have that advice count. So uh, Sam will be back with you in the fall to share her recommendations. There are a number of new TAB members that have not been involved in this work. So we wanted to make sure that they had plenty of time to dive into the materials that we provided for you this evening in advance of uh, all the great work that Sam's been doing, working very hard um, to make sure that we are making meaningful progress in our parking management strategies. Okay. What's the best way for me to give you feedback on things that you're not asking my feedback on? Wait until it's open for a public comment. Yeah, as a member <laughs> of the community, you are more than welcome to always send us an email if you have some suggestions mm -hmm. doing differently. We, we solicit that uh, input from the community all the time. In the memo, um, there were proposed revised uh, regulations, you know, city managers regulations for implementing because 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 the the ordinance basically gives the city manager lots of lots of leeway to implement and change regulations, which I think is a smart way to do it. Um, it wasn't clear to me whether the NPP stuff uh, was modified. I've read it multiple times over the last several years, but not very recently. Um, and so if there are um, changes in attachment B to the memo, uh, having a red line version to show what's new and what's different versus no, this is just what the state, uh, you know, current affairs is would be helpful for me is, is what was in the memo where it stands now on the books? No, <clears throat> apologies. Okay. What was in the memo is the new revised version. There's okay. a lot of uh, it's a little bit confusing to read, but I'm happy to provide the red line version. I would if love the like red to, line version. Yeah, if you'd like to dig into it more. I would. Um, and to the extent you're um, open to hearing feedback on it tonight, I think um, it's the same critique that I've offered over the, over the years about it, that um, it tends to be um, overly focused on how to expand NPP zones or whatever we're going to call them now, how to, how to make these, these zones bigger, um, and very little detail thought and attention paid to, um, what, what we do with underperforming blocks and blocks that are severely underparked. Um, I recognize it's, it's unusual, um, that, that, that something that's in an NPP zone would be underparked, but, um, you know, I live near the Mapleton Hill uh, MPP and it ha it is rife with examples of um, of blocks that are severely underutilized um, and I think that were included um, in earlier attempts to avoid spillover parking concerns. But um, to the extent that that our current system um, continues to be enshrined and uh, continued in these these regulations, when I think if a sensible um, system for including blocks in the past had been adhered to, um, as opposed to just sort of by fiat to avoid spillover parking concerns, we would probably have a more sensible um, way to manage some of some of these um, unintended consequences and unintended, un unnecessarily um, over-regulated things. I would also say that the, um, the, uh, prioritization of blocks for um, 
evaluation is a good idea. And I, a general question I have probably for Natalie and Chris um, is I know that already city council and I think community vitality is tasked with updating city council annually on how this parking permit stuff is going. Um, but it's a lot of staff time. It's a lot of, um, of, of effort and data collection and it doesn't actually happen every year. <laughs> we fall behind for very good reasons. Um, the program is not paying for itself, which is something you're attempting to correct. I like that. But what is um, laid out uh, in, in this, this new you know, annual evaluation and prioritization and, and priorities A, B, C, and D, it just, it feels like a whole lot more work for staff. And so as a realistic matter, Natalie and Chris, do, do we have staff time? Do we have bandwidth for staff to be doing this? Because this seems even more intensive um, than what we're supposed to be doing now and not delivering on. Sure, so Sam is um, here as our access coordinator. It is a fixed term position. We wanna make sure is not a burden on the general fund. Um, so any proposal that Sam is working to recommend that will include the possibility of, of reducing the size of some NPPs based on the data collection that she is in the middle of right now, um, there certainly will and needs to be a cost component uh, uh, as part of this. But overall, nothing that we want to be proposing in this work and and the work of community vitality as a whole is intended to be an uh, operate more as an enterprise fund, not a drain on the general fund, but uh, we certainly want to be either um, revenue neutral or contributing uh, so that we can be working towards uh, resolving uh, the many challenges that our community faces. And I might just add to that as well as, as one of the one of the avenues that we're pursuing and looking at to kind of decrease the amount of staff time spent on sort of the data analysis is how can we automate as much of this as possible, turn it into a, an online dashboard so it's interactive and then, you know, it's immediately available to anyone anytime to be able to investigate and see what really is happening on the ground in terms of parking occupancy. So it's a massive undertaking, um, but it, it aligns with some of the other projects that are happening in the city with the IT department. And so it's something that we're actively exploring and work and taking steps towards being able to provide as a service because um, obviously there's a need and, I, and it's worthwhile to have that information readily available and for performance-based pricing as well as for ramp, just to understand the occupancy, what's actually happening and why we're making these decisions about what we're implementing. So um, I can't promise that it'll happen by next year, but it is something that we're definitely working towards. And I'm, I'm hoping that will will help address some of your concerns as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, I didn't, add to that yeah, here. go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Sam. And I just want to acknowledge, you know, we've inherited in many ways, and Sam has inherited a, a program that was developed 30 years ago. Right. And the world has changed, and we certainly want to make sure that we are being, uh, we are evolving and responding to those changes. And, and uh, yeah, we there, by ordinance, there is this annual requirement of a written report that did become a very much check the box practice. Yeah. Um, and we're so lucky to have Sam. I'd say that maybe she and Mike Sweeney are the probably the most knowledgeable people in the organization. Uh, when it comes to the intricacies of the neighborhood parking management uh, programs and their history. And Sam is working really hard to make sure that, that uh, we are moving effectively into the future. So we really look, do look forward to sharing um, the recommendations of this work with you all this fall. Okay, my last question, if I can indulge our chair. <laughs> Uh, the NPP and the changes ramp um, still doesn't really have a consideration of um, the density of a neighborhood as far as I can tell. Um, I am aware that there have been particular carve outs for certain um, apartment buildings or blocks with apartment buildings that have occurred in the past that it seems to have been um, uh, a recognition that, that a second section was a little bit more dense than others. Um, but again, there are, there are places where people have the time and energy to petition for um, their block to be an NPP when the density really, uh, the amount of frontage for a, a household is um, incompatible 
um, with the idea that there should be uh, a carve out for, for residents. And so to the extent we can think about now, maybe it's too late now, um, but for future adjustments, um, it really does matter whether, a, you know, an average house on a block has 75 feet of frontage versus it's a 75 foot wide, you know, front entrance for an apartment building that houses 150 residents. It, it really does matter in how we manage parking in those kinds of areas. And uh, we're not taking that into account right now. Sam, I'm not sure if you want to share anything more on the KPI work. Well, I don't know if this directly, I mean, so that I'm not sure that there was a question in there, but I can certainly add that um, one of the, we're definitely looking at how to identify areas that aren't being self-identified by residents. And so it, while it doesn't directly relate to residential density, I think, you know, looking at trip, trip generation and then citation um, data as well is helpful for identifying new areas where people might not be, might not know how to engage the city on matters of parking management or um, might not know that it's an option. So that's one way that we're, we're trying to be a little bit more proactive and in, in going out and looking at new areas that um, maybe have a little bit of different residential density than, than you know, areas like Mapleton. Right. Um, that's a really good point. And it sort of relates to the, my question about like, is does staff really have the capacity to, to do all of the, the things that are, you know, pie in the sky here about monitoring and, and data collection? Because uh, Sergeant Vanderlee said, we don't know how many um, speeding citations are issued on this discrete section of roadway. And so when you're talking about looking at uh, parking violations of a particular stripe, um, you know, in a, in a section that's, that's managed parking, do, do we have the capacity to order that, look at that? Like, is it, what, what, what's Boulder PD not get that you have, or is this just sort of what we're hoping in the future is going to be possible? Uh, no, I would say that we have pretty detailed citation data, a record of it. Um, our, I'm not, I can't speak for Boulder PD, so I don't know what they use, but our enforcement staff, when they are issuing a citation, it logs the, the latitude and the longitude. And so we've been working, like I said, pretty closely with our IT department to try and um, create different reports to help us determine, you know, where are the hotspots for citations and then where do they intersect with um, we either NPPs or also these new areas that we're identifying based on trip generation. And so we're kind of looking at all these, looking at it in a lot of different ways, but um, it's, we've, like I said, we've been leveraging our relationship with the ID department pretty heavily to be able to do that. But we're hoping that the tools we're developing will make it easier and easier in the future to be able to pull this information really quickly um, as staff needs it to review it, so yeah. Great, that's exciting, thank you. Um, I'm not gonna take up any more time at the meeting tonight, but I do look forward to that red line version, if you could send it to me um, and uh, carrying on this conversation via email. Thanks, Joa. Ryan? I uh, just wanted to um, just, Go back. There was an earlier part of the conversation, Tila, um, with you and Chris, and I was following. I'm trying to follow it on um, the subject of wh where our where tabs feedback is is formally invited um, versus tab uh, members as community members are welcome to weigh in and um, just endorse. I think what I heard Tila saying, which is. Uh, TAB, uh, it would be great to invite strategic level feedback to TAB, um, and especially in consideration of, uh, as, as you said, Chris, th that this is a 30 year old program and we have, um, you know, a lot of uh, new, but, well, from a 30 year perspective, definitely new um, uh, goals and pressures, including um, decarbonization, including climate resilience, including the need to move to structurally change our system to one of multimodal systems. And you have here the, the, the appointed board of the city that's you know here to um, advise on high level matters of transportation. And so I don't have anything specific to say, but just that um, I would you know greatly 
welcome continued opportunities to, as the at, for as the board to officially weigh in on the the kind of higher level strategic direction of where we're going. Um, no no need to respond now. I just wanted to make sure that um, you have that for me. Thanks. Agreed. Thanks, Ryan. Anything else from Tab? Thanks, Samantha. Uh, thanks, Chris. Look forward to hearing what the final recommendations are in uh, Q4. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Next up, agenda item six. I see Scott Schlecht here for a snow and ice removal update. Alex, thank you. And uh... I apologize, I just muted myself. Um, if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, are we able to see the presentation? Yes. Wonderful. All right, well, thank you. Um, I'm here to give an update on our snow and ice control program, um, walk through, uh, some of our definitions and um, items and, and how we look at snow and ice control in transportation maintenance, um, give some updates on what we encountered last year uh, for the 2021-22 snow season, uh, and go through some of our expectations for the upcoming 22-23 season um, and, and preview uh, an update at a larger scale that we are just embarking on. Um, our overall snow removal program goals, support safe travels for all modes during snow events, operate the program efficiently, effectively, and safely in alignment with the transportation, Boulder Police, and Boulder Fire Master Plans, and provide informative and timely communications about snowstorms. Um, our inventory of areas, um, these are city owned assets that receive service during snow and ice weather events. Um, we plow about 52% of all streets, um, which is about 330 lane miles out of our 627 lane miles. Um, our on-street bike lanes, we plow 83% or 164 out of our 196 miles. Our multi-use paths, we plow 100%, uh, 72 out of 72 miles of multi-use path and 38 of those miles are completed by transportation maintenance. Um, some of those other areas of, of that uh, 72 miles is maintained by CU Boulder um, and some other private partners. Um, we do about 204 locations of crosswalks, turn islands, center medians, and curb ramps, um, and we shovel 38 bus stops. Um, there are others that are serviced by RTD, um, and then we do have a shovel a stop uh, volunteer program. Um, here's the definitions for our routes. Um, we have five primary routes. Those prioritize major streets. Um, four of those routes receive tandem truck service. So that's two trucks working together um, to clear a wider path with each pass. Our secondary routes provide access to hospitals, schools, and bus routes. Um, that consists of additional eight routes throughout the city. Uh, then we have conditional routes that are plowed under specific conditions. Um, and those are part of the secondary routes when conditions warrant. And then our on-street bike facilities are plowed with the streets that those are associated with as part of those uh, primary or secondary routes. Um, our off-street route definitions, uh, multi-use paths that consists of two routes completed by transportation um, there are other sections addressed by Parks and Rec and other contractors, as well as CU. Um, our right-of-way walks, um, that's one route completed by transportation. Um, there are other locations completed by contractors as well. 
And then crosswalks and curb ramps, we do the 204 locations across the city. And then the 38 bus stops um, by a transportation contractor. And then there's an additional 54 uh, service by the shovel of stop volunteers. And then RTD maintains the ones that they're responsible for. Um, our resource allocation um, is one dispatcher, one supervisor, 17 on-street operators and one and a half to two and a half off-street operators and an average of two mechanics and that's per shift and we have two 24-hour shifts or two 12-hour shifts to make up the 24 hours so it's uh, double staffing um, with those numbers. Now into the highlights of the 2021-22 season. Um, we did not receive any measurable snow until December 31st. And um, as we all remember, that snowstorm was on the heels of the devastating Marshall fire. Um, we received slightly above average snowfall in a shortened season. And my next slide shows the numbers that uh, we did receive. Um, we held a popular snowplow naming contest, and that will continue into the future. Um, we solicited ideas from the local elementary schools and um, had, had a great turnout, and um, it was a very fun contest to do. And uh, the children that did win and had their names selected um, came out for pictures with snowplows and their uh, snowplow names as well. Um, we did a pre-storm media and social media communications for every storm. Um, and we're getting ready to include our um, winter update um, in the water bills going out uh, very soon. And then uh, we did have a significant increase in customer requests um, despite the shortened season, um, basically from January to May. So here's the summary of the amounts that we received for the 2021-2022 season. Um, that's the first column. We received 87.3 inches. Our average in Boulder is about 82 inches. So we were just slightly above, but well below um, our 2020-2021 season. Um, we had the same number of snow events. And what was counted in that snow events is anything of, of uh, half an inch or more. Um, we called 74 shifts, and those are called based on the forecast. Um, we run two types of shifts. We run a, a skeleton shift, which is just transportation and mobility employees, um, which is a much smaller group than our full shifts. Um, we prioritize main major streets on our primary routes and then move to the secondary routes as needed with those smaller storms. Um, and then we spent uh, just short of $1.2 million, um, which is a $256,000 reduction over the 2020-21 season. Um, a lot of that can be contributed to, uh, we had salt on hand for our salt brine material. So we did not need to purchase any of that. Um, and then we were unable to get ice slicer from our vendor um, from about February through April, um, they were having supply chain issues and were unable to deliver material. Um, coming up for the 2022-23 season, um, we've identified that we need a comprehensive training program. Um, in past years, we would um, train folks in the yard during September uh, without snow, and they would get some in the seat driving the plow truck around in a controlled environment. Um, what we've identified is we have enough new drivers that we need to have them go with an experienced driver out on the roads during an actual snowstorm. Um, our hope with this is that drivers will be less likely to be involved in collisions with private and city vehicles. Um, drivers will learn how and when to apply de-icing materials uh, and, and where to plow the snow um, on their routes. Some of our streets we do uh, plow to the middle as in windrowing. Um, and then some of the streets we, or majority of the streets actually, we plow to the edge of the street. Um, and then 
drivers will be less likely to plow streets that are not on their route. Um, we had have seen in the past year some some getting lost. Um, prior to my arrival here, we ended up having a driver that made it all the way into Longmont at one point. So um, it, it can happen. Um, we're hoping that we'll be able to get these folks on the on those routes and and show them where the turnarounds are and and how to do it as safely and efficiently as possible. Um, expected challenges for the 22-23 season, um, staffing shortages. Um, we currently have nine vacancies in transportation maintenance. Um, fully staffed, we're a team of 27. So it's, it's pretty significant. Um, and 22 of those folks are uh, dedicated to roadways and then we dedicate four to the multi-use paths and sidewalks. Um, support departments are also experiencing similar shortages. Uh, these positions are hard to fill due to the nature of the work and the experience needed to be able to drive these vehicles. Um, typically, we also see some departures as winter begins, um, as folks start to understand that we do get a fair amount of snow in Boulder and it, it is time consuming. Um, we do expect some equi equipment issues, um, and we're still feeling some of that from last season as well. Um, recent bu budget reductions have uh, prevented timely vehicle replacement. Um, and then supply chain issues increase vehicle downtime. And we have been using a lot of temporary or Band-Aid repairs to get vehicles back on the road quickly during snowstorms. Um, but we do currently um, have some vehicles that are still being repaired and still awaiting parts from the 2021-22 season. So th those repairs are taking significantly longer than they have previously. Um, so coming up, um, we just began a uh, project to do a large snow and ice control update. Um, this will be a multi-year program analysis and update project. Um, our plan is to assess the current program, explore service level impacts to the city's sustainability, resilience, and equity framework, identify some ongoing metrics that we can use into the future, uh, explore community needs and expectations, and perform community engagement, including advocacy groups, internal partners, advisory boards, and city council. Um, so in the memo, I did state that we will be revisiting with TAB in uh, late this year or early next year um, for that engagement and, and feedback and comments on our update and, and what the expectations and needs are. So now I'll open it up to questions or comments from TAB and um, please let me know. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, but let me know if you'd like me to go back to any of those slides and I can pull it back up. Thanks, Scott. Do you have any questions? Right. Scott, thank you very much. And Natalie and the whole team, thanks for thanks for doing this. I know we were um, I know Mark and I in particular were pretty squeaky about wanting to talk about this um, back in the winter. And I know it feels kind of maybe not seasonal to do it right now in the heat, hottest month of the year, but uh, it seems like, you know, this is a really good time to talk about it in part because it, you know, things don't seem so, um, <laughs> here's this thing I just slipped on I want to talk about, um, it's a little, little bigger picture. So I guess a couple um, a couple things I'm remembering from some of the earlier discussions is, or yeah, just what we had sort of started a prompt on was um, thinking about the bikeway in particular, our, our grid of our, of bike, of our bikeways. Um, we have, if you look at the numbers of cyclists of mode share, it just, it, it's wonderful right now and it collapses and then it collapses to almost zero in, in really the cold months of the year. And I think some of that, you know, expected fine, but, um, you know, one thing I, I sort of have observed is that you, you, while we do have, according to the presentation and according to my, the knowledge I already brought with me is um, 
Well, we do have a, a really solid um, management in general of the multi-use paths. And we do also cover the bikeways that are part of streets that are being um, dealt with anyway. If you look at it from a perspective of what is the grid, the bikeway grid, how is the bikeway grid being um, being managed? Um, what we just tend to find, and by the way, I, I understand like this resource constraints and everything. So I'm just sort of talking first principles here. Um, what what we what I what we tend to have, or at least if I just think back this this last winter, is the the grid just gets totally chopped up um, from from a, the bikeway grid perspective. And I see it, you know, you see it in particular on some of the green, uh, the green streets that are considered uh, neighborhood streets, which we just don't don't plow in general, for probably for good reason, for at least from a car perspective. But um, it, what happens is, you know, the effect is it becomes the grid becomes unusable in a sense, right? It becomes as a system, the system become becomes unusable unless you have some kind of a corridor or a, um, you know, a short jaunt on the right place. Um, at, at least in the cases when you have, you know, following a storm. And in some of those cases, um, I can think of, uh, I think I think Juniper in North Boulder near Elmer's Two Mile is on the, is a green street, but I could be mistaken. But in any case, this is one with, that I, you know, personally am familiar with, um, connects the multi-use path to Elmer's Two Mile and, but it will go, I mean, it can go 10 days or two weeks in the shade there. And it's just, it's just a device. It's not every week, right? But it's some weeks. And, um, I guess my anyway. So that's my premise. That's the premise. I don't really have. I do have a couple of comments, but um, I first wanted to just ask about feedback. If I if I look at Inquire Boulder, if you look at Inquire Boulder or other just sort of community comments that come in and ask, and I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't have the data, but I'm just curious if we have any data that that um, that suggests. I guess agree <laughs> agrees with me or. Uh, you know, supports or, or doesn't support that this is something that people are, um, you know, or I guess are asking for more support with. So I'll ask you that as a question. And I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't have the data, but I'll stop now. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, we do have that data available um, through our um, request system. Um, and, and we can dig into that that way. Um, I'd say anecdotally, we do receive some feedback um, it, it, in that manner. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what what that feedback is and, and what percentage that is of of the feedback we do receive. Okay, um, would yeah, if it's not too much trouble, would love to. Well, I guess maybe I wouldn't. I'd want to be goal oriented here. I guess maybe I'll offer my comments and then maybe it becomes useful to look at that or not. So, oh, go ahead, Natalie, please. Well, Ryan, I was I was just going to suggest, and can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and I wanted to to clarify just so that everyone understood, um, you know, the work that Scott referenced that we'll be starting um, and there will be an opportunity for us to, to come to TAB and, um, and kind of exactly the feedback that I think you want to provide and that we want to hear about how we kind of shape our SNOW program going forward, um, which would be implemented not this coming season, but next season. Um, and the so that work is beginning now and we'll be coming back to TAB later in the year, early next year, as we get to that kind of phase of the work. But I think the reason I wanted to say something now was because your question about looking at the data, I think that will be kind of part of this process um, that we will kind of dig into what are we hearing from the community um, not just from Require Boulder, because that would be just a, a subset of community members, like we'll do a, a broader community engagement process. But um, I do think we'll look at that to just see from that subset of community who's engaging through Inquire Boulder, um, what is the kind of um, request need, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, so that will be part of, I think, the work that we're doing. And, and just to got this, so is there, did you just indicate there's another meeting we should look forward to, to give, to hear about? And feed, and, okay, and when, when yeah. would that likely be? Yeah, so the purpose, and I should have, sorry, I should have said something at the beginning of the item. I was, as Scott got started, I said, oh, I, I should have said something. So the um, the purpose of tonight was really, we're, we're at the point, um, we start our snow season technically in September. 
um, because we just have to, at this point, we need to start everything that Scott talked about. Like we've got to start getting shifts filled and everybody ready and trained and ready to go. And so um, that's why we're here tonight is to kind of just say, this is what, what we're starting from the transportation maintenance side and, and the program that we typically run looks like this. Um, and then also we are starting this more kind of an analytical work to shape a future program. Um, and, and really, you know, we recognize the timing is kind of funky because we're basically going to continue with our um, traditional snow and ice program through this season with no changes to the program. Um, and the reason for that was just work program resources. We couldn't actually do the analytical work this year um, earlier in the year. And so we're starting it now which just means next year we'll continue this work and then hopefully we'll be ready to um, start implementing, you know, some of the recommendations for next snow season. Um, so we will be back. I don't know that we have an exact timeline yet, Scott, on when we'll come back for TABS feedback on that, um, but it will likely be later this year, early next year. Yeah, Natalie, that's correct. We don't have an exact timeline for that yet. Okay. Okay, got it. Then if I could, I'll just I'll just uh, offer a couple of comments because I, I know how this goes. This will be months before we talk about this again. So just just some feedback um, as we think about this. Um, Scott, love, love the work, love the team, love you guys um, and gals and everybody. Um, so two, two things. I, I think um, the I would I would like to see this grid, the bikeway, the whole system, the bikeway grid, however you want to think about it, the key corridors and networks covered, comprehensively covered, and that, that that tends to often mean maybe you don't need to worry about a lot of the segments that are going to get burned off in the sun pretty quickly, but then there's shady spots that are going to just last a while, and they're known, they're probabilistically certain um, when we have, you know, weather, um, and it is, you know, we have, we have an incomplete system for six months of the year, and one of the cheapest ways to meet mode shifting goals, climate goals, probably vision zero goals in a lot of ways is this. I know it takes more money and resources, but you know we basically take this grid offline for a good part of the year and it, it, both specifically when we have weather, but then in people's minds, you know, they hang up their bikes because they don't think about it as a realistic system for them for half of the year. So, I, I mean, I think this is, you know, it takes resources, it takes some kind of rejiggering, re but um, this is one of the, it's just such an under, underutilized system of infrastructure we have in the winter. And I think, I mean, this is my my feeling or hypothesis or whatever, but th this is a way to really get a lot of bang for the buck for not a, not a ton of extra money, and even if we have to ask for it. So um, that's one. Second one is, it's sort of just a, related to that is, um, you know, the the on what we can expect, what probabilistically is, is the underpasses on roads like, or paths like at least Goose Creek, Elmer's Two Mile, there's just this insane morphology of, of throughout the day for, of like this thaw milk, and then you have ice skating rink and then it's thaw melt again. And um, it's known, I mean, we know when that's happening. And I think um, it, it's just a matter of, we ought to have automatically, ha you know, on, on the, the weather conditions in which that's happening, ha just have a lot more kind of automatic cleanup throughout the day. Um, we shouldn't have people have to tweet about it and complain. I mean, it's just, it should be just done. It shouldn't, shouldn't be something we have to worry about. Again, I know resources and all that. So um, that's what I hope the discussion is. And if we come up, this is a gosh, goodness gracious, this is going to take, you know, two million dollars more. Let's go to let's talk about a discussion with council or let's let's talk about what it would take, how important this is for our mode shift, climate, vision zero, and related goals. Um, because I think we'd um we'd find this is actually a pretty valuable investment to do it. Um, so that's my second. I have one more one more point after that, and then I'll finish. Um, I guess maybe it's also a question. Going back to Inquire Boulder and recognizing that's not the only way that people weigh in. Um, I, I know that is a way that people, especially the, the kind of super users who are going to know on bikes, at least for, for bikeways, who know the system pretty well, um, will will give feedback. And, you know, the user gets guided to certain question prompts. And, and I don't think there's one there that is asking these specific questions on let us know that that we have a bikeway that, that needs attention. Um, off the multi-use path and also let us know if the, there is a morphology ice buildup crazy thing happening under one of the bridges. Um, I would suspect if you were to have channels for those in Inquire Boulder or something like that, you would start to get a lot more feedback on those exact points and it you know might help to make the case. I don't, I don't know. Um, 
anyway, I don't know how complicated it is if this is like an IT conversation that's super complicated, but um, I would just um, love both for those to, those both to be more automated, but then if the, the automated process is not, you know, taken care of on its own, that it's really straightforward for somebody to say, oh yeah, this is my issue. And then just sort of click through without a bunch of, um, you know, figuring, oh, is this a intersection or is this a, whatever the, the category is. Um, so anyway, that's my feedback, um, just sort of at a high level as we as we go forward. Um, you're welcome to you know respond, but you, you don't need to now. And um, I'll be very eager to um, you know if some of this seems um, like needs it's worthy of debate. Let's let's talk about it. Um, I'm not I don't feel wed, wedded to any of it in particular, but it just feels like um, those those seem like some gaps we could address. I'll stop. Thank thank you. Any response from staff on that? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I just wanted to uh, say that I will look into the Inquire Boulder prompt. Um, I'm not fully familiar with the user side of it, but uh, I'll look and see if there's anything that we can do to improve that. Sounds good, Scott. Tila? Thanks. I am one of the super users in the in the winter, and uh, it's not too bad because you can always like key in a location if you stop right where you are and say, here's where I am, here's my issue. But I, I hear you, Ryan. And more to the point, I appreciate this like general discussion about resources, resource availability, uh, you know, what, what staff we have available. You know, Scott mentioned we've got what nine vacancies out of a roster of 27. Sergeant Vandaly said their enforcement um, people are at 50% capacity. Um, I asked interim director Natalie Stifler and interim director Chris Jones of two different you know pretty critical departments uh, in the city like does staff have time to do this stuff on parking enforcement so clearly we have some real shortages on um, um, the city's ability to deploy staff to address a number of, of kinds of um, priorities that we have and so I'm remembering from um, my participation on the pedestrian action committee, pedestrian advisory committee, when we were doing the TMP update last time, but we did spend a fair bit of time talking about snow removal and making things better for pedestrians and particularly people with disabilities on the streets and spent a good deal of time brainstorming about how to sort of activate the citizen core <laughs> so that we don't have to be relying on city staff to do everything. Um, and noting that we have a city council member, Nicole Spear on here, I don't want to put her on the spot uh, and she's just here to observe this evening, but I was curious, uh, Natalie, um, if there is appetite or would be support um, for trying to move some of this responsibility, especially on the enforcement side, for instance, for sidewalk, failing to shovel the slide sidewalk. Um, to more of a citizen related, as opposed to just referring a complaint to uh, enforcement, uh, referring complaint to transportation staff or uh, police department staff. Um, some cities um, have enabled a way for citizens to sort of um, file and enforce sort of quality of life violations. Um, New York City moved to um, an enforcement, citizen enforcement of an anti-idling law, which involves citizens taking a three minute video to prove that this car was idling for more than three minutes and then submitting it. And then the citizen would get half of uh, what the fine was. So there was a financial incentive for the people to do it. Um, there were actually people who started making a pretty good salary <laughs> enforcing on behalf of the city, things that were not confrontational. You don't have to talk to someone. You don't have to make an arrest. Um, but for things like someone has failed to um, shovel their sidewalk, I can take a picture of it, timestamp it, you know, and maybe I need two pictures 10 hours apart or something to show that this person has still failed to, to clear their sidewalks, but to refer some of this enforcement to um, sort of concerned citizens uh, and take some of the pressure off of, um, of transportation or police staff for enforcement of, of things like that might enable them to give resources um, where they're more needed on you know, bigger arterials. What are your thoughts on that, Natalie, and possibly Nicole? Yeah, I can um, speak to that. I mean, I think that's something that we could certainly, I haven't heard of that from like an, a citizen enforcement sort of angle. Um, so I think that's something that we potentially could look at as part of the um, snow program kind of update and analysis as, so, you know, kind of an expansion of our current 
program, you know, we have an adopt a, um, I believe, a, like a bus stop and adopt a right, transit we stop. Have, yeah, we have some adopt programs that potentially we could look to expand. Which, as I recall from when we talked about this last winter, we're under adopted. Yeah, we always are looking for more <laughs> folks to, yeah, to engage with that. Um, and, you know, I, I my sense is that some like informal, um, some of that is happening informally, right? But we don't necessarily have everyone um, enrolling through our programs, our formal programs. But that's something I think we could look at. I don't, Scott, do you have anything to add on that? No. Okay. And for the record in the chat, I see Nicole has responded. Likes the idea of neighbors helping neighbors and Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Um, you're of course welcome to unmute and chime in. You're we're welcome here anytime. She, but yeah, um, she may not have the. I'm not sure. <laughs> she may not be a, a co-host or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, there there was also definitely talk with the with the pack about uh, a volunteer core, um, and also about people uh, who could uh, if if they don't Im, um, impose a violation a, a ticket. Um, on uh, someone who doesn't clear their own sidewalk, um, documenting that the sidewalk wasn't clear X hours after the end of a snowstorm, clearing it themselves, and then sending the city a bill for the cost of clearing it, and then um, the homeowner being in charge of sending that bill back. Um, <laughs> there, there are some creative ways to do this that don't rely on an already overtaxed city employee um, workforce um, for what are really you know, quality of life violations with, that we can try to help people, um, you know, think more creatively about and, and resolve on their own. So I just want to add Tila. So I, my, one of my kids just overheard you and he thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I mean, we could involve kids, you know, we could do like a high school call out or even middle school and just I, I don't know. The kids are so um, willing to do stuff, and it's so fun to involve them. And you know, you could help. <laughs> Absolutely, Nicole. Are you able to unmute yourself? There you go. Yes, I can now. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you all. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, maybe interesting um, to check in with the city manager as well. Um, I'm not sure at what point it may make sense, but I know in, she's doing a lot of thinking around. Um, kind of code enforcement and um, how, you know, how we can um, make sure that folks are taking care of things like trash. And I, you know, I think snow removal and those kinds of things would fit into that um, as well. So um, it seems like that may be part of that broader conversation um, and work that she's doing. And um, Natalie, I'm not sure if you know more about that because it's not totally transportation related, but I know that this is something she's working on and we're going to be talking about the um, the new noise ordinance and some of those things that I think are also related, but my understanding is that thinking about this trash sidewalk clearance, those kinds of things are kind of the next thing that she's mm -hmm. got um, in the pipeline for uh, ways to ways to hold folks accountable and make sure that these things are getting taken care of. Yeah, that's a great point. We can definitely talk about that. Thanks. And it's nice to see you all. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Anything else tonight? on snow and ice removal. All right, thanks for joining us, Scott. Alex, um, if I may, just before mm -hmm. you move on, um, I did forget to mention, um, we will be having our snow training program. Um, we're hopeful that we're gonna have it at the fire training center this year. And I do invite every tab member to join us, um, come up, get in a cab, um, see just how big those things are. Um, it, it, it's a good experience and, and good exposure with staff as well. So um, feel free to do that. I will send out an update when we have dates solidified and locations. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Our final item of the night is a staff briefing on the transportation improvement program call for projects number four. And I think Natalie's gonna introduce this one. Yes, thanks, Alex. 
Um, so I just wanted to quickly introduce this before I hand it off to Jean. Um, and m mostly because I, it's kind of a continuation of a discussion that started several months ago. So just as a reminder, we introduced the sub-regional PIP process overall to TAB late in, I think it was all the way back in 2021. Um, and so, you know, with new members, I think it's helpful to kind of just remember that history. Um, and then we developed the criteria with TAB through the early part of 2022 for both of the sub-regional calls. Um, and then we completed, so it was two different calls and Gene will kind of re-explain this much better than I am going to do it, but there, it was two calls and we completed the call two process um, in June and we submitted three project applications with TAB support. And now we're beginning the project consideration process for call four, and that will open later this year. So we have, lot, we have lots of time to kind of talk about this. Um, the, the purpose of the item tonight is to just remind TAB of that overall process, um, especially the newer members, and then to introduce our staff's draft project list for consideration. And it won't look all, you know, it's not all surprises. It's a lot of what we've talked about. Um, and then we'll open it up for feedback from TAB regarding your ideas. So, um, sorry about that. My phone is very loud. Um, anyway, so with that, I'll turn it over to Jean and she'll, she'll explain all that in much better detail than I can. Great, Natalie, thank you so much for that introduction. And um, thanks for having me this evening, Tab. Um, Jean Sanson, Principal Transportation Planner with the city. And I'm going to take a minute and share my screen. Bear with me. Okay. Um. Okay. Are you all seeing slides or oh, are you seeing a presentation? No, we're seeing um, like the kind of, I think what you would be seeing. Got it. Yeah. There we go. Uh, we yes. good? Yeah. Right. Yep. Great. Um, again, thanks for having me this evening. And um, I am very much going to be looking for feedback this evening from, from TAB. So um, bear with me. I'm going to spend a few minutes um, walking through a little bit more of the details that Natalie started to, to share um, with the introduction. And um, before I get started, I just want to share what I'm going to spend these few minutes um, previewing with you. So um, first, just a general overview of what the tip is. And I know that we have some new TAB members um, this evening who kind of came in midstream in this, this last process. So I think it's a good refresher for us all of what the tip process is and how the city uses these funds. Then I'm going to share um, an update related to the call to project funding awards, which I hope will be good news for all of us. And then I'm going to walk through um, what Natalie alluded to, which was our um, TIP project selection approach, which we've been working um, with TAB collaborative, collaboratively on since um, December of 21. Um, and then I'll share the initial um, call for number four project recommendations. And again, these are very much staff level recommendations and they're intended to open a conversation um, with TAB to develop a, a, um, a full list to evaluate for uh, moving forward. And then I'm gonna talk next steps. I know Natalie said we had a lot of time, but I'm gonna say personally, I don't feel like we have a ton of time because these things um, tend to speed up particularly um, when, uh, when it requires quite a bit of um, conversation and community input and both quantitative and qualitative evaluation. So um, let me get started. So um, let me see, did I just, sorry. Okay, are you seeing a slide that says Dr. Tip, Dr. Cog tip process? No. You are. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, so this year, the city of Boulder is submitting transportation project funding applications to the Denver Regional Council of Governments, or Dr. Cog, as part of the 2022 through 2025 and 2024 through 2027 transportation improvement program. And that's um, what TIP is short for. 
And as a reminder, Dr. Cog uses a project selection process that splits available funding into two shares, right? So there's a, there's a share for regional projects and the share for sub-regional projects. And this year, there are two calls for regional projects, calls number one and three, and two calls for, for sub-regional projects, calls number two and four. So I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible, but I, it, it is confusing and there's a lot happening this year in terms of these four calls. So the city of Boulder submitted three project applications for call number two on June 24th of this year. And now we're proposing to submit another set of sub-regional project applications in early 2023. So as you can see at the bottom of the slide, 2024 through 27, call number four applications are due January 27th. Um, this is the call number four set of projects and this is the main topic of this meeting's presentation. So before we jump into the selection of call for project applications, though, I'd like to share how we fared with our call number two tip applications. So I am pleased to share that we were successful in securing tip funds for the three projects we submitted for funding earlier this summer. So these include the 30th Street preliminary design project between Colorado 7 and Colorado 119, the Baseline Enhanced Transit Stops and Protected Bike Lanes Project between 30th and Foothills Parkway, and the Transit Priority Intersections along Broadway at Table Mesa and Regent with the potential to include um, intersection and lane repurposing between those intersections. So all in all, we requested approximately $6.7 million and we anticipate being awarded $6.4 million. The two highest scoring projects will receive full funding, and those were the 30th Street Preliminary Design Project and the Transit Priority Intersection Project along Broadway. The lowest scoring of our projects was the baseline project, which the Dr. Cog Subregion Forum TAC or Subregion Forum has voted to fund, but just at a slightly lesser amount than was requested. So we requested $3.44 million, and we anticipate receiving $3.122 million, or approximately. 300,000 less than initially requested, but a substantial enough amount of funding that we're confident we will build the improvements that meet the goals of this multimodal project. So now that the subregion forum has voted to approve these funding amounts, the full Dr. Cog board will take action on this recommendation in, in September, and these project funds will officially be placed in the 2022 to 2025 TIP. So there's one more hoop to jump through, but we expect that this will be more of a formality and we're fairly confident um, that this will be approved in September. So I hope everyone is pleased with that news. I know that we are at the staff level. So looking ahead, the process for identifying the next set of candidate projects to submit for the call for 2024 through 2027 tip, sub-regional project selection process, it's a mouthful, will continue the work done in coordination with TAB between December of 2021 and May of 2022 to select call number two and number four projects. So just as a refresher, the process included a staff team scan of the over thousand projects included in the transportation master plan for those that reflect the priorities and the principles of the city's transportation investment policies, as well as maximize the ability to score competitively and receive funding under the Dr. Cog criteria shown here. And um, this is important because this is how our projects are scored. So as you know, there's a sub-regional impact of the project, which is scored at 25% of the total score. And then the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan priorities accounts for 60%. So that includes things like safety, active transportation, air quality, multimodal mobility, freight where applicable, and regional transit. And then these last two criteria, project leveraging 5%, so that's essentially how much match you are providing, and then project readiness accounts for 10% of the project scoring. So this is really an important guide for us as we move forward. So as you recall, we narrowed down the extensive list of TMP projects to the 15 shown on this slide. And we added the baseline enhanced transit stops and protected lanes project at the request of TAP. We then used a more fine grained set of project selection criteria and applied them to this narrowed set of projects. And this criteria closely matches the Dr. Cog TIP application criteria and advances the priorities of the city's TMP, as well as the newly established core arterial network. 
Um, I won't read each one of these, but you can see um, it includes subregional benefit, um, VMT and GHG reduction, and um, TAB was instrumental in helping us to better define what that meant to include both transit priority and bike infrastructure. Safety, so are we located in a high injury network corridor, high crash locations? Equity, so we look at the demographics of the area served by the project. And then project readiness, so where are we in the project development process? Do we have completed concept or design drawings and a high level of confidence that we can complete the project within the time frame that the TIP dollars need to be spent? And then cost effectiveness. So we looked at the potential to leverage partners, um, partner funding, mainly CDOT or CU, um, and the timing of that funding availability. So you'll also note on this slide that there's the consumer report style table, um, which we reviewed with staff this spring, and it was the product of this evaluation. And here's the consumer report table again. Um, with those projects that are being awarded funding in call number two grayed out, I'm not sure how well you can see it on this screen, um, and those projects that staff recommends to be considered for further evaluation for submittal in call number four highlighted in yellow. And also note at the bottom of the slide that we would very much like to hear project ideas TAB members may have this evening and would hope to use this list as a starting point for our conversation. So now let me step through the projects we are recommending for consideration, some of which might look familiar and some of which have been updated. Um, so the first project, the West Colorado Avenue Multimodal Improvement Project between Regent and Folsom, would complete the Colorado Avenue corridor project west of 30th Street and would include protected bike lanes, transit lanes, and a consolidated transit stop, similar to the Broadway and Euclid transit stop, if you can envision sort of that super stop concept. Um, we have a high degree of confidence that CU will partner on this project and staff is continuing to coordinate on the refinement of the project design as needed. And we expect this to be an approximately $5 million project. And what's really neat about this, and I'll just say it again, is that it connects so many components of the work that is underway, either design or construction, along Colorado between 30th and CU's main campus, connecting the two campuses. So moving on. This next project would construct multimodal improvements at an intersection of two of our core arterial network corridors, 30th Street and Arapahoe Avenue. Um, the safety improvements at this intersection are pretty high priority given that it's the high, second highest number, it has the second highest number of fatal and serious injury crashes of those projects evaluated. Um, we also listen to TAB's prior concerns about the cost of this project, and we want to assure TAB that we will be maintaining flexibility as we move into project design. Specifically, we'll be initiating preliminary design of this project in spring 2023, whereby we'll have the opportunity to revisit this concept and conduct a more detailed analysis to determine the feasibility of TAB recommendations to modify this design and potentially reduce project costs. So this is a funding funded piece of this project that we will begin it. We will be starting in the spring. Following the preliminary design process next year, we would begin right of way acquisition in spring of 2024 as needed for the project. And then the tip call number $4 would then be used to fund final design and, the con and construction of the project between 2024 and 2025. So I'm gonna move forward, next project. So, this next project, the um, US 36 28th Street West Side Multi Use Path Project between Four Mile Canyon Creek and Broadway, is an important project for the city in that it completes the 28th Street Multi Use Path from the south end of the city to the north end of the city, providing a safe and comfortable separated bicycle path and pedestrian path, and completing our gaps in the low stress walk and bike network. Um, you know, like the project, the prior project we were looking at, staff has heard to have feedback on this multi-use path project, and I'm pleased to share that and our engineering team went back out and re-examined this area for a new alignment that we think both reduces costs and better integrates into North Boulder neighborhoods. So the revised route, which is shown in gold on this map, would eliminate many of the more expensive drainage and grading improvements required in the original route, and more, almost as importantly, well, I would say as importantly, 
creates a better connection in the neighborhood, particularly the Boulder Meadow, Meadows Mobile Home Park as seen here. So we're currently in the process of developing design and cost estimates for this new route, but we anticipate that it would substantially uh, reduce the cost of the original project, which was estimated to be just under $5 million. And last but certainly not least, um, this next project, the 30th Street Multimodal Improvement Project between Colorado and Baseline Road would fill in an important gap in the multimodal core arterial network and connect to the 30th Street and Colorado under, underpass currently under construction, as well as planned and now funded improvements along Baseline Road. So, you know, staff is of the opinion that this project has a lot of momentum now that it may not have had earlier because it fills in the final missing link to the subregion via 30th Street and Baseline Road and may score better than prior funding applications for 30th Street. Um, we also estimate that this project is in the range of six to seven million dollars, but like the other projects, we will be updating and refining project costs. So what's next? Uh, looking forward over the next several months, after this evening's meeting, we expect to come back to TAB next month with evaluation results, which would include an update of the projects that we've just reviewed this evening, as well as any additional project ideas that TAB would like to share with us this evening. Then we would move into a community engagement process through October. Hope to come back to TAB in November for a recommendation and public hearing with City Council's endorsement in November or, just, or in the November, December timeframe. And as I noted earlier, project applications would be due in late January. So the questions we have for you this evening is one, do you have process questions, which I assume you may, um, and then do you support consideration and evaluation of the following projects that we just reviewed? And then does TAB have additional candidate projects for consideration and evaluation? So with that, maybe, I, maybe I'll just leave this slide up for a minute and open it up to, to TAB for questions and input. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Yeah. Congratulations to you and the team who submitted those lengthy applications. It sounds like we got 90 something percent of what we asked for. And it seems like enough money on baseline still to, to do something meaningful there. So, so congrats, first and foremost. I like the way these questions are structured. So we'll start with the first one. Does TAP have any process questions? The, I guess. Oh, oh Trini, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask. I mean, I guess since I'm kind of new to this whole entire process, um, yes, I I would like to know if there was an additional project. Like, I know that I'm skipping to kind of like the last question, but <laughs> if there was a project that I would like to suggest, I mean, how would that? I would just like tell you guys right now, and and it would be okay. So I'll do that later, but um. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and yeah, congratulations. I mean, this is incredible news. And I am so excited, especially about the one on baseline, because I travel on that one a lot. And I know how how important that is. I mean, it, the crossings are just non-existent <laughs> so, so, I mean, for pedestrians. It's just crucial. But anyway, yeah. So um, but anyway, if anybody else wants to chime in and, and I'll say stuff later. But thank you. One process thing I would like to note is that in the memo, it says that the city's not interested in looking at the East Arapaho Bridge primarily because TAB was concerned about the project scope favoring vehicular travel modes. And I think the way it's presented to us, the primary reason for the doing that project was to save lives. And in talking to Erica during her final days, she indicated that staff had fallen victim to CDOT misinformation. And so if that is the case, I think it's um, like that should be reason enough to not do the project. I don't think that really falls on us. And conversely, if that's not true and staff would like to move forward with that project, I think we would welcome uh, a case for doing that project and you should feel welcome to present that to council as well. So I just wanted to, to note that. Thanks, Alex. I was gonna make similar comments that I thought it was a little incomplete, the discussion of what was going on on that item. Um, so I will just share that um, we, 
At, at the staff level, we don't, we would not recommend moving forward with it right now because we do need to have more conversations with, with CDOT um, about the timing of these funds that they would have for the bridge re replacement and where it falls in the order of priority. So um, we'd recommend that we hold on that for now. Understood. Any more process questions? Seeing none, we've got feedback on the first four projects, the West Colorado Extension, 30th and Colorado, or sorry, 30th and Arapahoe, the 36 multi-use path alternative routing. I like the new routing much more than the existing one. Um, and then the south section of 30th Street from uh, Colorado down to baseline. Tila? Thanks. I would definitely, I'm generally supportive of all four. I would really like to hear a little bit more board discussion about the 28th Street multi-use path um, configuration. Um, I know when we talked about it last time, I think Alex, it was you and Ryan who went, wanted to see more connectivity to the neighborhoods. Uh, and my sort of objection to that, and I don't know if I stated it on the record at all, um, was sort of that that's not who the cyclists who are there are, you know, that uh, there is a significant amount of cyclist traffic out on US 36. Um, I'm, a, I'm a roadie myself and cannot fathom why people do that because it's, it's very unpleasant. It would be nicer to have, you know, as much more protective infrastructure there as you can. Um, but the alternate routing that Jean showed, I thought, well, um, it looks like just looking at the map, it at least doubles the mileage in that section that um, that the cyclists would travel. And you know, when you do something like that, you tend to help the interested but concerned component of um, of the people that you want to see out on bikes. Uh, and then it just doesn't matter for the experienced sort of brave cyclists out there. So I guess a question I think I want staff and tab to talk about is, you know, who are we trying to serve here? Um, who would we be making life better for? And is that worth the investment? Thanks, Tila. Hopefully that's something we can address in more detail next time. Does that sound fair? Yeah, I think it sounds fair. I would just, you know, when when you say like I like that alignment better, Alex, I'm Tila wants to go in the record and be like, I'm not sure I do like that alignment better. Um, but if we can make a good case, and particularly a case that helps, um, you know, score points on the safety issues or um, or illustrates that we are um, sort of enhancing not just recreational but regional transportation kind of options for people, then we could be making a better case for this alternate alignment. And so I just want to keep that um, in mind. Thanks. For the record, I think it's probably the fourth out of the four. And for you. Yeah. My, and I have some ideas and I'm another other. So I doubt it cracks. Yeah. The... Well, I remember in the last iteration, it was it was like nine million dollars and then it went down to just under four million dollars and so it, it does feel like there are some really significant um um maybe it's flood impacts i'm not sure but there are some clearly some really pricey considerations that go um hand in hand with where we route it and what we're trying to do there and so really looking forward to hearing from staff about you know some creative thinking about how to avoid some of the big um, money sinks on that, because I do agree, like point A to point B is a significant thing to be trying to achieve, um, and I am generally appreciative of that, of that effort. Um, but I was not, I was not happy with the with the price tag on it. And then similarly on the West Colorado section, it look, looks like it's about a sixth of a mile for five million bucks. So it's thirty million a mile, which seems there has to be something we could do to. Um, maybe have a little flexibility with what was identified at the conceptual level in the corridor study and, and what we could accomplish through this TIP project in partnership with CU. And Alex, just so I'm clear, so this the 28th Street one that we're talking about, that would end around J Road? Is that like the end of it? That little stretch would be from, I'm just trying to visualize this on the, on the map. Jane, do you want to pull up the map? 
I think it would stair step from J Road up to the existing multi use path further north on um, 36 and tie into Broadway. So the yellow line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Trini, um, if you can see that, so it would follow 36 up to J Road. Yeah and head west on J Road and then north on 26. And then there's actually a, a piece of property, publicly owned property right at 26 and 20, 26th Street and 28th Street or 36, where we could punch back through, back mm -hmm. on 28th Street, follow 28th Street, and then head west again on Violet and north on 19th to really connect the Boulder Meadows community to this facility. Um, and to your point, Tila, um, you know, connecting communities um, such as Boulder Meadows um, would, would really um, score well in terms of serving equity populations. Um, and and uh, so, you know, we would do more analysis there, but that's, and then it would tie into the multi-use path as it continues north along US 36. Thank you. For me, one of the real objectives with CAN was the network component of it, core arterial network, and it's having facilities that connect to one another. And we're at an exciting point where I think you've correctly identified some some potential big gaps for uh, like interested and concerned riders, uh, people bicycling, and so that makes me very likely to support the West Colorado piece if we can get the cost down so that it can connect Folsom, which we're planning to work on, and the rest of Colorado, as well as the South 30th piece that would connect all the ongoing work with 30th in Colorado and the exciting news of the baseline improvements coming in. Any other feedback for staff on these four projects? Yeah, okay. I, thanks. Um, I guess a lot of my concerns are just, and I'm maybe this is a process question. Um, I'm, I, I have concerns about design, the design elements of a few of them. I mean, I think cost is one relative to distance, but also like on the um, West Colorado one, it looks like some of the protected lanes are actually painted lanes with the right turn where the cars can just cross over the lane. It's like a mixing zone. And to me, $5 million and then we get mixing zones is not like a great outcome. Um, and um, it, like just people, like the average person doesn't want to ride there. Um, and so that's like, that's a concern to me that if we're going to make, spend that much money making it protected, like it really needs to be protected um, such that someone would feel comfortable having their nine-year-old ride on it. Um, and um, similarly, I think with the Arapaho and 30th intersection, I think, you know, of course, a lot of, like some of the elements shown would make it safer, but I'm still concerned about six lane road on 30th at the intersection, no pedestrian island. I mean, that's a lot of lanes for somebody to cross. And again, it doesn't make me feel that like it's a safety, a really fully a safety project when we're asking pedestrians to cross a road like that, especially on 30th, which um, maybe coming to this sort of fourth project, I would love for it to be a smaller road and not an arterial road. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's largely that section between baseline and Rapaho, do I have that right? No, baseline in Colorado, sorry, um, is you know, largely residential uses right around it. Um, and so, you know, I, I wonder, like, maybe, I don't, I don't know, I, I've kind of lost track of different phases of 30th, so forgive me, <laughs> I'm going out of order with it, but, um, you know, I don't know how set that design is, but, like, is there not an opportunity to make this a smaller road, make this a, a three-lane road, and be able to use that other lane to reduce costs so we don't buy right away to add other facilities. Um, I mean, I, again, I know I've, I've said this in the past meeting, but I live on one of these arterial roads. It's not nice. <laughs> um, it'd be so much better if we could think like these are neighborhood streets, even if they're wide, they are places people live. And, you know, the more we can make them feel like neighborhood streets, especially, I mean, 30th, 28th is right there. People want to cruise through town, you know, We've got a highway on either side of them, 28th and Foothills. 
Um, so I guess I just want to see, like, I, I'm not opposed to these locations or the intent. I just would love to see the design sort of locked in more on high standard for comfort, um, for quality of life, for safety. Um, I just think we can push it further, especially if we're going to get this much money. Um, like, let's really make the most of it. And, and acknowledging that council is going to have to stand behind those kinds of decisions um, if they're going to, you know, change the roadscape a lot just to provide that political support. Thanks, Becky. I agree. Hopefully we can um, yeah advance some of these these older concepts that are that are five plus years old and we've, we've learned a lot of new things since those were developed um, and hopefully we can get some more clarity on these in the coming months at this point in time though does anyone have any more feedback on these four or should we turn to additional ideas not seeing any training you want to go ahead with an additional idea For additional ideas. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so there's one very troublesome street for me, um, which is Moorhead. And I know that I've tried to um, mention that before. And it's the stretch from 27th Way all the way to Table Mesa. And I believe it's a, a road that's used by all sorts of people. Like, there's students that are college age. There's students that are coming back from Manhattan Middle School. Um, it, it serves as a connection to the bike path. So you as a cyclist are guided onto the street. However, the bike lane is not protected. It's just, I mean, at best it's a white line. Um, sometimes it's visible and sometimes it's not. I mean, I appreciate that we try to maintain it, but but ultimately the speeding on that road is, it, it, it's crazy and I, just feel that if we could reassign the space of that road, it's wide enough to where we could have a like a, a complete protected isolated bike lane or multi-use um, path uh, to serve all the people that are coming from the RTD station on Table Mesa, and you know using the the connecting well as a connector to the little shopping strip area and of course feeding off to the path both to South Boulder and to CU. So I don't know how you guys feel about that but I mean I Becky I mean I know that you're an expert at reassigning um the the like street space but I mean, I, 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 and I don't know what the dimensions that would be required for what I'm suggesting are exactly but just from a person that uses that road on a regular basis. And, you know, has been there in multiple weather scenarios with or without snow. I mean, it's just very troublesome to me because I, I do see it as a highly used kind of overlooked road. I know that the path is a couple of like streets over, however, depending on what your needs may be, it does add significant mileage and it's uphill mileage, mind you, um, to your journey. So that's my suggestion. <laughs> Thanks, Trini. Hopefully staff can provide some feedback either now or uh, at the next update if you want. Yeah, I mean, I think my, I'd love it if we can um, kind of just hear the board's discussion and, and their ideas, and then we can definitely, we're going to take that back and talk about it internally. I don't know that we'll be prepared to address every idea right here in the moment. Um, so yeah, feel free to have those discussions kind of amongst yourselves, and then we're certainly taking notes and we'll take it back. Okay. Yeah, Trini, I like that idea. I think that Moorhead is due for resurfacing through the pavement management program sometime soon. And past board member Mark McIntyre had thrown out the idea of Moorhead being like a super neighborhood green street, especially with CU South developing. It, it can help connect the campuses and the neighborhoods and the, the access to the regional transit center. So I think that's a great idea. Thank you. And Alex, just as an additional thing, the markings for 
So if, I don't know how familiar you guys are with this particular intersection, but the 20, 27th way and the, the Moorhead crossing, if you are on the bike path heading towards 27th way from Table Mesa, um, the way it's marked, there's really, there's a crossing for pedestrians, but there's really not a turn for the, for cyclists. So you're like kind of left with either going on the wrong direction on the bike lane on the opposite side of the road or having to go onto the sidewalk. There's really not a choice. And I'm talking about a child. I'm not talking about perhaps a more experienced cyclist, but, but a younger person that, that may not have the experience. That's what they have to do. I mean, and I know that it's legal for children to ride on the sidewalks, but still it's not optimal and it's such an easy fix. It's just, I think, paint and just having the right signage. Um, but anyway, so that would be like my immediate suggestion because it, it's quite dangerous. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else want to go? Ryan? Um, I am a fan of, of a, of a um, strategic approach, and I think we have a really exciting uh, strategy with CAN, and um, it's sort of a meta suggestion, but, but um, what's next on the list for CAN? And I, I think Iris is on there at some point. I, I don't have the timetable memorized, but um, I'd be the most excited about, you know, any projects that can, that can support CAN. And, um, Let's just stay really focused on that strategy. It's not the only thing we have to do, but I just, I'd say let's, let's be disciplined about CAN. I think baseline is a great example of something from CAN that we've been able to advance through the TIP process. So I would second both um, IRIS and Folsom as things that this council has championed. And while they're still our council trying to get some commitments out of them to take these big bold steps that Bob Yates said, be bold, Matt and Rachel telling staff that you can. Um, I think that would be the, an opportunity to, to strike right now. Tila. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, I had written down Iris basically. Um, and I was going to ask, I know uh, you know, we stopped and looked at 15th and Iris on the CIP bike tour, and that was where um, I think several TAB members were surprised that as part of the CAN effort, um, Iris was basically just slated for a study, um, but I don't recall whether there was um, funding available for a study, but uh, I would definitely like to see some action on Iris. Um, I, you know, I think that the largest unmet needs on the can are Iris and Folsom right now, um, but in terms of what it feels like today to use them, Iris is a far inferior uh, experience. And so trying to yeah, leverage um, our efforts and focus staff's efforts back to CAN as directed by council, I would, I would say Iris rises to the top. Um, I also wanted to... Um, highlight that uh, community cycles had, or was it just Kurt Nordback, somebody from community cycles. <laughs> and, and I apologize because I'm privy to some other <laughs> communications, but someone wanted to suggest from the community um, also that we focus on, um, I think it was highway 119 between 28th and 47th. Um, I can pull up the email here, but I, I just wanted to raise that as, as a, a something that we've gotten from the community. Um, I'd like to suggest it's Kurt Nordback, um, but this did get some um, um, approval or um, uh, encouragement by other members of the um, advisory committee on um, community cycles, uh, adding a safety study of safety and perhaps transit improvements for a diagonal from 28th to Independence Road. Um, because there were two um, fatal and severe, severe crashes, 34th Street and 47th Street. Um, you know, one of them, a double fatality at 34th Street and 47th Street was a cyclist um, who was um, hit and badly injured by someone running the red light there. So I, I felt I, I should raise that as, um, as something that has been of interest 
um, an A question with both that section, diagonal from 28 to independence and iris is in terms of how we score things for TIP uh, on project readiness. Are, are we, are those sort of equally unready or equally ready or do we have any concerns from staff on, on um, considering either iris um, or this, this section that's been highlighted by Kirk? I recognize uh, staff's probably not going to respond right now. It's just, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, I think that's what we'll definitely go back and discuss. Great. Thank you. Certainly. Yeah, I appreciate the community input and would, would welcome more ideas from the community. And there was the double fatality, there was the bike crash, and then there was another fatality at Independence all in the span of a month. So that's certainly an area. Yeah, the, the, the single fatality was, looked like it was probably a heart attack at the wheel or something, so. Speed's always a factor, though. Speed is always a factor. Thank you. Uh, continuing on with the CAN projects, I think the downtown study is something to consider. Downtown Boulder serves as a regional multimodal center. People get there a bunch of different ways. And right now with downtown going through a visionary study, now might be the perfect time to start to build out that vision um, on the ground with some multimodal improvements to those streets. There was a, I think perhaps a segment missing from the CAN map, but included in the council CAN network is a small segment of Valmont showing protected bike lanes there where they're only from Folsom to 28th Street where our TMP currently calls for just a neighborhood Green Street. And the thinking there is that to the West, there are many fewer travel lanes and then it really flares up at the Folsom intersection. And then to the East of that segment is where the transit village area planning phase two is gonna kick off. And I'd have to imagine that the unprotected bike lanes that are out there today are not gonna suffice after that planning effort. And so now might be a time to do a, a low cost protected bike lane treatments on the, the west side that will hopefully match up with what happens in the future on the east side. And then um, one idea outside of the CAN geography would be to take a closer look at Table Mesa, either some sort of cycle track or protected bike lanes from Broadhead to Moorhead. I'd only really consider that if they were relatively low cost. Um, similarly, Foothills to Manhattan, where Ralph Cook was killed riding his bike last year. If there's something low cost we could do on that arterial that is a regional entry into Boulder, that's something I'd consider. And the final idea for Table Mesa would be to take another look at the overpass area and consider a study there with CU being a partner in that with its proximity to CU South, CDOT being a partner with all of the regional highways that pass through there. And of course, RTD with both the, the park and ride and the local transit that, that run through that area. I am, um, yeah, I definitely support if there's opportunities to move quickly on parts of CAN, um, Iris being mentioned, um, and others, you know, I'd start looking at that again, especially if they're, um, as Alex said, kind of lower cost or relatively um, you know, ways we can kind of reallocate space that are relatively low cost. Um, uh, I also on, I selfishly, because I use South Boulder Road and Table Mesa a lot, you know, I'm uh, very supportive of improvements there also where, um, I think was is Ralph Cook on South Boulder Road was killed. Uh, was that is that right? The right name location was yeah. Um, that intersection. That's I live that intersection, and like within one span of one week recently, there were two crashes. It's like you can hear them from my apartment building. Each time you hear them, you like wonder if somebody's died. And even if it wasn't like along the whole road that there was a protected bike lane, even just fixing that intersection, it's uncontrolled, it's downhill, people come cruising. It's just, it's, it's really dangerous. It's horrible to walk across. You have to run. Um, I just think, you know, it, it, and that's really just yeah, any, any opportunity like that where we can identify these like places that are uncontrolled or highly unsafe. Um, I'd love to see those just sort of 
highlighted within the projects we're doing here. I'm really just looking for the most safety benefit possible, um, just given how devastating it is to sort of live in these areas and hear over and over and over the crashes happening. Um, so I'm not saying that some of these other projects don't have that. I just, if it's, you know, if it's not the one in front of me, I'd love it to be another one that's, you know, where somebody else is, where they're experiencing this kind of just like repeated devastation and just the, the cost that it's exacting upon everyone to have these really dangerous and controlled intersections on arterial roads. So anyway, just kind of general um, support for, for that within any of these ideas. Thanks, Becky. Any other ideas or feedback from Tab? I guess I'll close by just thanking staff for giving us this opportunity. I think we collaborated last time and had a very positive outcome and it sounds like we're starting with an even larger pool of potential projects this time. And um, I think if you have any questions for any of the people who raised these, feel free to reach out if that would in any way help you better understand what the intent of the projects are um, or what we're picturing. Thank you, TAB members. This is very helpful for us. Um, and we will be reaching out as needed between now and our next TAB meeting, but this is a really good list for us to um, evaluate alongside the four projects that uh, we initially recommended. So thank you for the thoughtful conversation. Thanks, Jean. And next up is matters first from staff. Jean, do you have a regional transportation update for us? I do. Um, let me see. I'm going to share my screen again. So, oh, that's what I was looking for. Do you guys see a map of East Arapaho? Yep. Okay, great. Um, you know, what I wanted to do this evening, oops, sorry, I just lost my screen. Sorry, give me one second. Shoot. I am looking at a black screen right now. <laughs> yeah, it's black for us too. Goodness. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can fix that. Ah, how about now? Oh, Got good. It. I'm so sorry for those technical difficulties. Um, you know, what I wanted to do this evening was just take a minute to um, share with, with all of you what we foresee the project development process for East Arapaho being. So, you know, when you think about our regional corridors, like 36 and Colorado 119 between Boulder and Longmont, um, and Colorado 7 uh, between Boulder and our Eastern communities out to I-25 and, and beyond. Um, you know, we've really made quite a bit of progress on, on this uh, quarter in particular. So um, what I just wanna share is just a little bit of a timeline stepping back to when we developed the East Arapaho transportation plan. So that was a, that was a long range transportation plan that developed a, a vision concept, if you will, for improvements on Arapaho between Folsom and 75th Street, which is actually out in the county, and then connecting that transit service, that bus rapid transit service, um, all the way to downtown Boulder, um, possibly Boulder Junction, and all the way out to I-25 and beyond to Brighton. So um, just keeping in mind that all of the improvements that we'll be making, planning, uh, designing, funding, and constructing on East Arapaho are part of this larger system plan. And then within Arapaho, East Arapaho itself, we have been successful in securing um, regional tip dollars to advance 15% design for a large extent of the quarter between 28th Street and 64th Street. And that project is going to begin later this year. We're thinking fourth quarter of this year. So, you know, that's really the next step for us, taking that East Arapaho transportation plan vision concept into 15% design to understand the right-of-way needs, 
the environmental considerations and the, and the more fine-tuned costs. So we're gonna begin that um, in 22, this year and it'll extend in 2023. And then we've also been successful again through regional TIP dollars in securing um, $3 million to complete, to advance that 15% design to final design for our priority segment of East Arapaho, which would be between 28th and Foothills Parkway. And so that final design would begin in 2024. Um, and then I just, you know, I'd also note that while we're looking at these more long range planning, design and construction projects, we're also out there designing and constructing improvements in the coming years. So I know that TAB has been very instrumental in um, helping us to um, refine the design for the East Arapaho multi-use path and transit stop enhancement project. Um, and we're gonna be in construction of that next year. And then again, I would just point to the 30th and Arapaho protected intersection project as an important element of East, the East Arapaho project development process and something that we've already covered this evening. Um, but if we do end up submitting that project, we would hope to use those federal tip dollars um, for construction in 24, 25. So I hope this helps to kind of provide some context and put all of the pieces and parts of the East Arapaho project together for you. And that was really just the intent of, of this um, update for you all. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Jean. When these improvements are designed, who would pay for the implementation? It's a state highway with RTD operating transit service. Or would they be major contributors to the costly construction? Or would this be something that we'd have to chip away at almost exclusively through TIP? Um, so I would defer to Garrett because he has more experience working on these um, CDOT arterials that run through the city as to how we would uh, approach that, uh, the project funding. Good evening, Garrett Slater, Principal Transportation Projects Engineer. And uh, historically, that has been the way that uh, the city has implemented corridor visions over time is through tip cycles. The difference in the Arapaho quarter, I would say, is that we now have a lot of momentum from the State Department of Transportation, CDOT, in identifying um, Highway 7 as a, a, a corridor that's of importance regionally and statewide. And so uh, as an example of that, the uh, preliminary design for 30th and Arapaho is being funded not by city or TIP, but by Senate Bill 260 funds, which came to us through the state. And so we are optimistic that uh, we will continue to see opportunities like that flow from the state to the city for us to be able to implement the East Arapaho transportation plan and the state, state Highway 7 corridor plan. That'd be nice. Anything else from TAB? Awesome. Natalie, any other matters from staff that were on the agenda? Nope, that's all we had. Thanks, Alex. Next up, matters from the board. We are meeting again tomorrow at 2.30 to finish up our retreat. Um, I think an agenda will go out shortly in advance of that that the facilitator put together. Um, any other open board comments? Alex, can I just pro prod you on that? Um, is, is there any either like initial thinking about what that looks like tomorrow that we should be ready for, or is it is it helpful to hear any <laughs> brainstorming or input on preparing for that? I think bring think of priorities for the board in the year to come, and hopefully we can find something that is actionable. And yeah, but I, I just think of, of opportunities you see and, and priorities for us moving forward. That sounds great. I'll just offer my two cents then to the um, <laughs> to, to you to think about because um, I, I know I was kind of um, one of the squeaky wheels on the need for something like this. I think it would be exciting. Well, I just say what I'm excited to, to, to do is to is just to hear individually from the board members on their own terms. What are they excited about? Like, what do they think what's important? And then then following that, um, just some discussion about like trying to get to what can we do with that? But like really giving people the space to just why they're here and what they're excited about. So that's just my sense, um, and I'm happy mm -hmm. to contribute in any way. Yeah, absolutely. Got a lot of fresh faces here and 
for us who have been here a while, we've finally gotten to our materials. And so I have no idea what any of you are going to say. So looking forward to it. Any other open board comment? Tila? All right, I'm having real technical difficulties over here. Um, I would just like to, we saw several slide presentations tonight. I know the slides aren't usually added to the tab materials, but to the extent that um, our emails are public records and sometimes I wanna see like what the heck we were presented with, I would request that we be sent the slides that Devin showed us on the crash updates. Um, the ramp amps slideshow that we got and um, Jean's stuff on the tip, please. Just so I have it in my email around this date. So when I'm trying to remember in the future what the heck we talked about, I have it at least at my fingertips. And if there is a, you know, a core request, then, then we have a, a way to get that to the public because it's something that we were discussing and talking about and uh, it's not readily available for people listening to the audio of this meeting after the fact. Yeah, we are. Thanks, Tila. We are trying to make it a practice that all the presentations that are shown in the meeting are sent to tab. Cool. Um, and so, and and typically we're trying to do that before the meeting. You're right. Um, so if there was anything that did not get sent to you before the meeting that was presented tonight, we will get it to you. That's why I checked during the meeting, I believe the crash update from Devin Joslin, the ramp amp stuff and the tip stuff was new to us. Okay, great. Terrific, thank we you. Got, we didn't get the usual email with the presentations. Right. And then I also didn't receive the email that Kurt tried to send our way. Did other board members receive that? From... I did not. And so that's why I thank you for sending it. Um, I saw from Kurt, he had sent something, but I didn't even get my copy on my other email. So I don't, I, yeah. Thank you for, I don't know how you got it, Alex, but thanks because uh, I would not have seen it in time for this meeting. Well, I heard that I didn't get it. And so it makes me ah, wonder the other thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there must be something going on because I, I'm receiving like the PowerPoint email that Meredith sent and I also received Chuck's email. So um, we might- It might be a, within the city of Boulder's email network versus us being outside email addresses that has definitely held things up in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll a staff look into that. Thanks. Terrific, thank you. Mm -hmm. I didn't receive an email from a Chuck either. Okay. Any other open board comments? If not, our agenda shows for future agenda topics. Just one thing so far in September, uh, DCS, Design and Construction Standards update. Mm -hmm. Any other inputs from TAB before and I have the agenda setting meeting with Natalie? feel free to reach out to us in the coming week or so if anything comes up. There's a chance I won't be at the September meeting, but I'll let you all know and give Ryan a heads up, especially as vice chair, as soon as I can. And with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Thanks, Tila. I'll second that. All those in favor? There's a message in the chat from Nicole Spear saying, good night, everyone. Thank you, Nicole, for attending again. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. I know, right? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Oh, great. You still have a motion on the table, I think. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>